Greetings. Welcome to The Dividing Line. My name is James White. Good to be with you. We have a lot to cover today. Breaking uh, news right now amongst the uh, Southern Baptists. Interesting stuff going on uh, in the SBC Executive Committee. Uh, stuff hitting um, media right now in regards to uh, basically telling the uh, <clears throat> pastors' conference um, they're gonna they're they're gonna get they're not gonna have a place to meet <laughs> if they don't change direction uh, within a week. Um, and uh, I don't know if you've been watching any of this. You know, I'm not a Southern Baptist, but. I first served in a Southern Baptist church, graduated from Southern Baptist uh, University, Bible college then, um, uh, taught in Southern Baptist seminaries until Paige Patterson had me fired, um, and, uh, you know, and uh, still a minister in a lot of Southern Baptist contexts, and so, you know, as the Southern Baptists go, there's, it, it's, it's an indicator of where other things are going in, in our society. And what is the name, the, the church on the, is it the church on the Gables or something like that? Um, what's the name of that? <laughs> just, just, I, I'm sorry, but I mean, this stuff has been coming out and Glades, Glades, Gables, Glades has something with a G in it on the golf course, whatever. Um, wow. I, I mean, have you watched any of this stuff? A little, yeah. I, I and and the thing is, as soon as you post any of the videos, you just know what you're gonna get is gonna be all these people going, well, you know, maybe you know, like like Tom Buck posted that comment from the pagan dude who attended and was like. Wow, that was a great party. Is and I just I is I I, re I retweeted that and said if you are reaching for the keyboard to post something about creating relationships, stop and grab a Bible and start reading an Acts and and listen to the sermons and then ask yourself a question: Are we smarter than the apostles were? Because, I, I mean, just just as, you know, Paul talks about conviction coming upon those who might visit um, the worship service. Not entertainment, not, not a, a good Yelp review, <laughs> but conviction. And, oh, goodness. Um, but there was, a, there was a video of the pastor of the Church of the Glades, on the Glades, near the Glades, Smelling like Glades. I don't know. Um, <laughs> there was... Psh, that's what they need. It's more like a disinfectant. Lysol. <laughs> Church of the Lysol. Um, but uh, he was... Um, he was doing something uh, about what he was eating or something, and he was wearing what looked like saran wrap green puffy pants. You missed that one? You would have remembered that one. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you would have remembered that one. Is that the one you were talking about? You were going to do a test of death? Yeah, somebody was, somebody was, somebody made some comment about, uh, you know, would, would Jeff, would Jeff Durbin wear, wear those pants? And I said, if somebody can find them, I'll buy them. <laughs> if, if, if Candy can give me the right size, we'll, we'll give it a shot. You, you never know. You never know. What? No, I, I'm just over here laughing. Yeah, yeah. Well, you 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 pulled you pulled the uh, you pulled the microphone. No, up, I so. just got to keep it ready here, you know. Because, oh. uh, <clears throat> but uh, you know, actually, pants like that, you need to get the right size and then order a size lower. Well, no, no, yeah. no. These were these looked these were puffy. These were sort of oh, like they puffy were pants. They oh, were... so they were. Um, um, oh, what was the guy the the rapper? That I don't remember. I don't pants. know things yes. like that. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you're you're going the wrong direction with that one. Um, all I know is they they were really really freaky. And then there was one where he they built a huge uh, couch on the stage and 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 it had trampoline in it so you could jump on the couch. And he started his sermon by jumping up and down on the trampoline that was supposed to be a couch. And I, I'm. <laughs> I'm not making any of this stuff up. 
And so, you know, this is supposed to be a pastor's conference, you know? And so this is one of the guys that's coming to tell you how to do it. Um, and, and that's aside from all of the, I mean, they did a Billie Eilish song that is just utterly profane. They changed a line because it was too profane to do, but it's still like, there's such a fascination with the world on these parts. We just want people to feel comfortable. And I remember, folks, I remember the late 1990s, the late 1990s, I was teaching a Greek exegesis class in Ephesians, I think, for... Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. And I had a student who was taking that class and a, it wasn't, it may have been missions. That wouldn't make any sense. But anyways, was taking more than one class and he was telling me about how at that time they were teaching everyone that there are certain words we don't want to use in our culture, so we don't turn people off. And one of those words was repentance. You don't use repentance. And back then, there were people going, this is going to result in this. No, 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 stop, 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 stop. Here we are. Here we are. You, you've got Southern Baptist pastors, or maybe he's not Southern, I don't, I don't even know if he's Southern Baptist. I don't know if it's Church of the Glades, is even Southern Baptist. I don't know. Um, but you've got you've got people in, you know, he wasn't wearing puffy pants that day, but um wearing puffy pants and jumping on trampolines, and that's where it goes. That's where it goes. And and people now look at that and they go, that doesn't look anything like what the apostles did. How did that happen? It's been happening for a long time been happening for a long time that's pretty tame compared to or no th what's pretty tame compared to that is just what 10 15 years ago we'd hear stories about pastors who would ride their harleys up on the stage thing. and then preach with the harley behind them yeah same thing but they thought that was cool and it's, it's gotta be cool yeah it's gotta be cool it, it, it's it's a fundamental lack of confidence that the truth of god brought to life by the spirit of god is still going to do anything. And that's a theological issue. I mean, that's, that's, that's literally a theological issue. And you would think that people who have a Bible in their hand might already be aware of the fact that the worldview that it presents and the worldview being adopted by our culture are two completely different things. And trying to get the culture to think that we're cool means you, you have to rip first Corinthians chapter one right out of your Bible along with a whole bunch of the rest of the New Testament, but especially that one. First Corinthians chapter one, I mean this is exactly I mean that we are trying the wisdom of the world and um, the result is is pretty ugly. And why would we want to go this direction is the next question I would want to ask because um we are having right now further uh, perversion of worldview and human relationships uh, not only modeled for us, but then we're being told that, that this is this is how we should be. Um, I have a um, yeah, I've got a, I got a screenshot here. Uh, this is from uh, this morning. and uh, so Dwayne Wade's powerful message on Good Morning America. And uh, Dwayne Wade spoke with Robin Roberts about his daughter Zaya's gender identity. He has a son. He has a son um, who has bought into the insanity of our culture and wants to be referred to as a female. And so... This powerful message. Well, what is this? What is this powerful message? Well, here's here's, and we would expect Ellen DeGeneres to be 
super excited about this. But this is this is the world we live in. This is the worldview of the people we work for. Um, there are people close to me who work in secular jobs, and they have to. One of their uh, assignments this year is to incorporate and report upon how they're incorporating specific kinds of of inclusivity, which of course means excluding the old ways and including perversity, sexual perversity, um, and things like that. We're all facing this, except I, I don't, I'm not going to be facing this, uh, not working here. Uh, we as a ministry will, will face exclusion, uh, from, from social media and everything else. In fact, I had the first one of my posts, uh, smashed by Facebook it's funny, they did it three or four days after I posted it. And it had already gotten, as I recall, hundreds of likes and comments and, and everything else. And then like three or four days later, it's gone. And it was a little Facebook thing I did with a picture of Pete Buttigieg and his um, illicit lover, um, biblically illicit lover, um, and how he would be introducing him when he became president as America's first gentleman. And I just made this straight up statement in a, there is in no possible biblical worldview, is this man a husband to anyone? There is no husband here. There is no wife here. There is no marriage here. To say otherwise is to stick your middle finger in Jesus' face. If you're a Christian, that's what you're doing. You think you're so wise and you're so cool. And Jesus just didn't know. I've never understood this. And and I I asked, I asked Graham Codrington this. And he didn't have an answer. Nobody has an answer. Didn't Jesus know that a small percentage, but still a percentage, of those crowds that he addressed? I mean, if 3% is the number, uh in the feeding of the 5,000, that's 150 people, 150 people who in that culture were oppressed. And he who rescues us from our oppression never said a word. In fact, he reestablished and confirmed the bigotries, because that's what we're being told it is, the bigotries that oppressed these people. Who was Jesus? You see, I'm sorry, but someone like Graham Codrington, uh, who's now all gotten into all the, the, the gender stuff, too, and I'll, I'll debate him on that. I mean, uh, there's, there is no way, there is absolutely no way that you can hold this book in your hand and promote transgenderism. You can't do it. You, you have to take this book and say, these authors were Neanderthals. They were behind the, ball, the eight ball. They didn't know what they were talking about. And Jesus was nothing more than the product of his time, of his day. That, you, what else do you have? How, how, can you, how can you look at the Bible and not see that the God of this Bible is the creator of all things? He made them male and female. That's in the first chapter. Second chapter, Jesus says it remains true. So I so people like Graham Codring, the people who go that direction, I have said, give them 10 years, and they will not even pretend to think that this is has any sense of consistency any higher existence than mere um, human literature edited over time. That's, that's the only way, it's the only way you can go. That's the only way you can go. And we're seeing that, we're seeing that a lot. So on the screen here is uh, Ellen DeGeneres and D. Wade. Uh, just, just listen to what's said here at the beginning. First of all, I just, I think it's what every, you know, every parent should be is what you're being right now, which is unconditionally loving your child and supporting you. your child in whoever they are. I mean. 
unconditionally. Okay, she's she's not a parent. She never can be because she has chosen not to be. Uh, in a true sense, she's not going to bring anybody into this world or anything like that. Um, in the natural way of doing things, um, having a relationship with a man, providing the examples of a male and female, the, the things that God designed us to do. Um, but somehow she knows exactly what parents are to be and, and what parents should be are unconditional loving of their children, whoever they are. No, whoever they choose to be. You know, I am so thankful that my parents didn't just sit back and go, well, who would you like to be? I don't mean that my parents forced me into ministry. I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy. So they they never, ever said a negative word about that. Um, they supported whatever I want. I'm not talking about career choices or anything like that. We're talking about who you are as a human being. And unconditional love now means unconditional moral bankruptcy. So it's, it's, it's unconditional love to not provide guidance. Well, first of all, protection to your children from the insanity of the world that would cause this kind of confusion. That's the first thing. But then it's unconditional love to support the confusion itself and the, the fantasy that you are something that you're not. This is, this is unconditional love. These folks don't have a clue what unconditional love is. When you're a father and you have a son, a young son, and that young son, maybe you didn't protect them, whatever, but all of a sudden they decide that they want to be a female. Your job is to help this young man find out who God made him to be. As a man. I mean, are they really seriously talking about going the whole route here? We're talking puberty blockers? Destroying the boy's body? Never be able to be a father. Never be able to be a mother. Massively increase suicide rates. That's what we're talking about. That's unconditional love in our society now. Really? No, that's unconditional insanity. It doesn't matter how much money you got. He's got all the money in the world. And obviously nobody in his life seemingly is able to speak to him and provide him with any kind. I'm, I'm not talking about the boy. I'm talking about D Wade here. He's old enough to know better than this, but this is what the insanity of our society, this is wokeness creates brokenness. Brokenness. I, I, the, the media doesn't want to talk about it, but there are all sorts of people starting to speak up who went down this road and now they're like, that is messed up. And now I am messed up. I'll never be a father. I'll never be a mother. I'll never have a natural relationship again. All because I bought into this stupidity. And now my, my health is ruined. I have pumped my body full of hormones and drugs. And <laughs> we are... We're actually going to outlaw forms of vaping, but we will, uh, with, a, with court authority, allow and force certain parents to allow eight-year-olds to be given puberty blockers, which we know have 10,000 times the detrimental impact upon their health. Massive increases in cancer and everything else. And yeah, that's okay. We have to, we have to be woke. <sighs> Talk about simply putting your fist in the face of God and saying, we will destroy life. You may be the source of life. We will destroy life in the name of our own happiness. Even though we really know, if we would stop and think about it, um, that this is pure stupidity. 
I, I'm I'm don't even know what to say. You can tell it is it, it is very hard for for people in my um, in my generation. I, I know there are people my age that have bought into all this stuff. I get it, but for for most of us, it's just like, really, you're you're really, well, it's 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 stunning. Oh, I, yeah, it's it's cultic. You bet it is. Uh, it's it's very cultic. Um, yeah. Uh, real quickly, because uh, I've got a big long thing we're gonna be doing today. Uh, real quickly. So Pope Francis uh, last week informed us all that uh, tax cuts are. Are sinful, and um, so I'm. I'm going to start, and and I I I bet there are some Roman Catholics that would get on this bandwagon. I'm going to start a movement um, to, because see, Francis is not Francis the first. I was confused about that at first. He's just Francis. If another pope comes along and chooses the name Francis, they'll be Francis the second. And then he'll be referred to as Francis I, but of course he'll be dead by then, which, well, I would think so, but who knows? Maybe he'll resign and then to, he could re resign. The next guy could decide to be Francis too, I suppose. I don't know. Um, but the point is, he's right now he's just Francis. And so I'm, I'm going to start a, uh, a movement, and I think that we should uh, now be referring to him as Francis the Marxist. Um, because you have, you know, you know some, of the, some papal names are descriptive, like Innocent, who never was, but Innocent. Um, but Francis, what does that say? So uh, I think we should just refer to him as Francis the Marxist. And uh, all you Roman Catholics who for years have been going, hey, you know, we've got the Pope to tell us, we've got the Pope to tell us, and now you're going, oh, but I'm not going to listen to what this Pope has to say. You're being inconsistent, but I fully understand why, because your current Pope is a loon. <laughs> um, and he's a Marxist, and he doesn't understand economics, and his viewpoints will actually uh, exacerbate poverty. Um, and, um, he, of course, unbiblical, uh, complete complete contradiction of any meaningful biblical understanding of something called work. Um, uh, fairness in, in pay, yes, but not equity. There's nothing, there, there's, there's nothing ever. Uh, in fact, the one place where Jesus talks about pay, everybody got paid the same, even though people work differently. And it was the master's choice to do what he wanted to do. It wasn't, not exactly a Marxist perspective. Anyways, but to our Roman Catholic friends, um, you, you've got, you got a problem. You've got a problem, and his name is Francis, and he is a Marxist. Uh, I am going to throw out a, um, uh, something here. Um, I listened to a... 55-minute uh, video. Uh, let me see if I can get the name here. I was going to I was going to contact him before um, before doing the program and I, I just got uh, rather rather busy and I didn't get a chance to do it. but I, I'm, I'm going to contact um, this fellow. I, I listened to a fellow by the name of Matt Frad, who is an Australian uh, Roman Catholic apologist of some sort. Um, and he was on a program with a gentleman who identifies on the program, I think it's his name is Cameron, Cameron Bertuzzi, maybe. Maybe that's who it is here. Um that he, he identifies as a Protestant, but did not know uh, what a Protestant, yeah, Cameron Bertuzzi, clearly did not know what a Protestant actually is. Uh, seems to be in the William Lane Craig general camp, uh, theologically speaking, I guess. Uh, but I listened to it yesterday, 
And I, I thought about just going through the whole thing um, because there was so much there, but there are other other things to do. But I would I would love to actually have Cameron on if he'd be willing to do it. Um, because certainly everything that his Roman Catholic and he, he said we're very ecumenical here. Okay. Um, but everything that his Roman Catholic guests said, we have responded to literally for multiple decades. Um, there, there was, I, I don't believe there was a single thing, you know, they talked about prayers to saints and to Mary, uh, you know, we've done entire debates on these subjects with leading Roman Catholic apologists. Um, but it, it really seems that the interactions that we did over the years are just the younger crowd, I guess, has the feeling that if it was done more than 10 years ago, it can't possibly be relevant anymore. Because I, I don't think they were using 1080 uh, cameras or something like that. Um, but what really caught me in listening to this was the guy who's supposed to be the Protestant, who doesn't know why he's a Protestant. And you know that that's someone who is who their boat is within three feet of the shore. <laughs> they're not in the middle of the Tiber. They're, they're within three feet of the shore on the far shore. Um, I, I, I'm going to contact him and see if, if, if he'd be willing to address the same issues and questions here. And that might be interesting because I, I just, I don't know how many times we have talked about the reality that a large portion of non Roman Catholics today are only non-Roman Catholics on the matter on the basis of taste, not on the basis of conviction at all. Um, and so, anyway, uh, yeah, there we'll 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 do something along those those lines. One last thing before we dive into the big subject for the day. And the first we've already spent the first half hour. Uh, word came out a couple weeks ago. I didn't talk about it, but um, it has. It should be in the past now, or let's see, today's the 18th. It might actually still be coming up. Uh, it, uh, maybe it was this coming weekend. Is that what it was? Anyway, um, the reality, yeah, here it is. And the date on this, uh, looking real quickly here. Uh, I'm not seeing it coming up. But anyway, um, that there was going to be a Roman Catholic mass said in St. Pierre Cathedral, which was the, the, the big church in Geneva, um, specifically uh, where uh, Calvin uh, preached many of his sermons. And, you know, I, I just wanted to make reference to it we we know that the vast majority of people in geneva there there are sound believers there but the vast majority of people there have little knowledge whatsoever you just i mean you may have seen i, I may have even shown on the program that recently uh, gay activists uh, climbed up on the reformers monument and poured multicolored paint uh, over the statues um, Switzerland just, just voted to make homophobia, uh, a crime. And so you, you see where the Swiss are going. And so it's not overly shocking that there would be, Hey, let's, let's all get together. And to be honest with you, it's not really a Roman mass. And the reason I say this is the article points out that they're going to invite the Protestants to participate. That's not a Roman Mass. Rome has said from the start, for as long as I can remember, um, that the Mass is, and if you, if you understand anything about Roman Catholic theology, this is the only way it could be, is only for baptized Roman Catholics. And so to, to go... 
hey, let, we'll, we'll, we'll just let everybody participate. That basically means it's not really a Roman Catholic mass either. It's just an ecumenical feel good thing. But if you obviously know anything about Calvin's theology and what he actually wrote, then you know, he, despite all of that, he would still be more than slightly upset. Now, will he know about that? I don't think so. Uh, Calvin is absorbed in, in fellowship and worship with his Savior, and um, one of the subjects that came up on that program I was just talking about was about, well, you know, I'm just asking, I'm just asking the saints in heaven to pray for me. That means you're dragging the saints into all the sinful stuff going on here on earth, because you may, every single day, there are Roman Catholics that ask saints to pray for things for them that would actually be sinful. So what you're saying is that when saints die, they don't get to escape the pollution of this world until the end times, I suppose, uh, because they have to be constantly being bombarded with sinful requests. Yay. Yeah, there's lots of that in the New Testament. <sighs> anyway, um, but yeah, you may have seen the, um, um, you may have seen the announcement of this and Certainly, it saddens us. It would be wonderful if 500 years down the road, has, it's not quite 500 years, but uh, toward the end of my life, we will be celebrating the events of the 500th anniversary of Calvin's uh, life and ministry. And certainly, given Calvin's willingness to stand in front of people and keep them from partaking of the Lord's Supper. Um, there would have, and they had swords, <laughs> um, there, there would have been significantly more violent reaction of, against Roman Catholicism and its attempt to bring the Mass in and all the theology that underlies that. I think one of the reasons, well, there's a couple of reasons why, why Protestants don't really care about this anymore. Uh, a, they don't have a meaningful theology of the cross anymore themselves. Um, and B, they know nothing about Roman Catholicism and know nothing about what Roman Catholicism teaches. And so when they hear it, they're like, oh, well, that's interesting. Hadn't really, because they have no convictions. <laughs> they, they're just, oh, well, that's, that's interesting. Hadn't really thought about it that way before. Oh, you know. And that's why this kind of stuff can can take place. And those of us who actually know these things and recognize how central they were in history and realize that many of our, our leaders of the past were willing to give their lives about these things, are left shaking our heads and going, those who forget the past are going to be doomed to repeat those things. Um, so with all of that said, uh, you'll notice that I have some of my, you know, I've, I've finally gotten into the flavored water stuff. Well, it's actually good. It's actually good. I've got to get used to it because um, it's a long story that I'm not going to bore you with now. <laughs> we have a lot to get to. Um, I think that the video that was produced by Talking Christianity Apologetics a couple weeks ago uh, I would just like to say to a bunch of people, welcome to my world. <laughs> welcome to what I've been dealing with for many, many years now. And it is very encouraging for me to hear um, other people saying what I've been trying to say and have said with a great deal of clarity um, when this whole movement really started getting up some steam. And um, that reminds me, I'm going to uh, grab my Jeffrey Rice Tyndale House Greek New Testament. I haven't shown this to Peter Gurry yet, but he's a young man. He could snatch and run, and I don't know I could catch up with him. But uh, I'm sure he's never seen a Tyndale House Greek New Testament this nice. Um, so we'll have to, I'll have to show that to him. Um, and my Nessie Allen, so... You know, the only thing I don't have is an SBL one, but anyway. 
I'll grab my Nassiala when I have the opportunity here. There was a discussion about how we should deal with the subject of textual variation that included Dr. Peter Gurry of Phoenix Seminary. Now, Dr. Gurry is actually younger than my uh, son, um, so he is a young man, but he is al already widely published. Uh, the recent book on myths and mistakes in New Testament textual criticism, he uh, co-edited uh, that particular work uh, about the only semi accessible to layman introduction to CBGM is written by himself and Tommy Wasserman. Uh, his dissertation from Cambridge on CBGM is obviously a fuller discussion of that particular subject. And uh, so, uh, and he's also a co-director uh, of the Text and Canon Institute out at Phoenix Seminary. They have a big thing coming up this weekend. I'm teaching in, in uh, Nevada this weekend at, in, um, in, the Gardnerville area. And um, so, uh, but in other words, he's doing a lot of work in this particular, uh, this particular area. So he was invited on along with James Snap Jr. Now, I don't know what caused James Snap to decide that he would aim his artillery at me for the, about the past 20 years or so, but, but he has, um, but I'm just going to say straight up, if he sees this, I was really impressed with James Snap. Um, I, I felt he was fair. I thought the stuff that he had to say. In fact, I just realized I forgot. I was going to cue up a really fascinating observation that he made about a early medieval manuscript in comparison to P72. P72 is the earliest handwritten copy we have of First, Second Peter and Jude. And the number of words different between P72 and the NA28 and this medieval manuscript and NA28. It was a very valid observation. I think it's an ob observation that probably mirrors in many ways what CBGM would reveal to us, but we won't get into that right now. So, so you had Peter Gurry, you had uh, James Snap Jr., Who's who describes his perspective as a um, as a form of eclecticism, um, not reasoned eclecticism. What was the term that he used? Uh, he basically said that his his methodology is fully eclectic in that he says that the Nessialan platform isn't really eclectic. It, it's way too heavily weighted toward a now dated phrase called the Alexandrian text. I'm sure he's well aware of the fact that CBGM uh, has not yet actually established um, the existence of an Alexandrian text to begin with. That's another subject we can get into. Anyway, those were the two textual critics in the conversation. And like I said, I thought James Snap's uh, contributions were extremely helpful. Uh, he uh, vindicated himself quite well. I'd like to get to know the man. I don't think we're ever going to agree directly, but I, I wish I am absolutely convinced. Let's put it this way. I'm absolutely convinced that James Snap Jr. believes he is seeking to be consistent in everything he's saying. And I've got, you've got to honor that. You've got to, even when you disagree. And even when I think he's been rather unfair to me over the years, um, maybe he had his reasons. Maybe Maybe there was something I said or did in the past that I don't know. But anyways, I was impressed. And I would, uh, and obviously we're going to link to this and you can find it yourself. It's easy to find. The only thing I would say to James Snap is he needs to be a little more aggressive. He needs to be a little more aggressive. There, there were numerous times where I, I wanted to hear what he had to say about something. But he, there are certain people where that kind of a context just isn't their thing. He, by nature, he thinks before he speaks more slowly than some other people do. That doesn't have any reflection. Unfortunately, in the TV age, it does. But it has no meaningful reflection upon a person's actual intelligence. Uh, in fact, one of the smartest guys I ever met in my life, you would ask him a question, and there would be times when he would literally sit there silently for 30 seconds before responding. 
because he was formulating it all in his mind. Now, when he did, it was a tsunami of information. But in our day, the speed with which you speak and respond is taken as indicative of how well you know the information. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's just simply a personality thing. But James, if you see this, you just got to speak up a little bit more uh, because there were there were six or seven times where either I could tell you wanted to say something or I wished you had added something and you just got talked over. You got to you got to push a little bit harder. Were you were you agreeing with that? I was. I just I that was the one thing about him that really stood out to me. I was going to characterize it as a man who exercised tremendous patience with yeah. the conversation. And yes, like you, there were a number of times where I really wanted to hear, what does he have to say yeah. right now? Right smack in the middle of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you recognize the name, but he's he's been sniping at me for decades. Yeah. So, but the fact of the matter is, uh, credit where credit is due. Uh, um, I, I was I was impressed. Um, anyway, um, and let me let me just say, by the way, People need to understand something here. Before we dive into this, this is this is a big area. We we have talked about this area for forever, but more and more people are being brought into it. So we continue to address it because it's important. If you take um, James Snap's material and what he would view the New Testament as the best readings of each of the variants in the New Testament, okay? He tends to, his beginning presuppositions would tend to result in the idea that you're going to have a majoritarian perspective. Not majority text specifically, but it's going to be more majoritarian so there's, there's sort of a built-in um, preference for wider attestation than for earlier but unique attestation, I think would be a fair way of putting it. Anyway, you take his New Testament, you take Tyndale, which basically says it has to be in the first five centuries. We need to have it in the first in the manuscripts of the first five centuries, that's what's what this is this is based by, which is really very different um, from where uh, James Snap would be coming from. And then you take the NA28, which is different from the Tyndale. You can take the SBL if you want. I don't have a printed edition of the SBL. Um, have it in Logos and Accordance, stuff like that. Um, you take these texts, and I'm going to tell you Right now, once again, if you apply the same rules of hermeneutics and interpretation to all of those texts, all those printed, collated editions of the Greek New Testament, you are not going to have a different faith. You will have a slightly different list of verses that you would go to to establish particular things, but you will not have a different faith. So, James Snap's New Testament is going to be, is going to communicate with clarity the gospel of Jesus Christ. So does the NA28. So does the Tyndale. So does the TR. In fact, when you look at the stuff that we constantly beat each other senseless over, Almost none of it has any overwhelming doctrinal um, weight to it. Administration versus fellowship in Ephesians 3.9. Well, there is a difference. I'm not saying it's not important. I wouldn't have written a big, long response to Jeff Riddle if I didn't think it was important. But that's not, not going to change your theology. The pericope adultery is not going to change your theology. The long reigning of my, Mark, you know, no, no. if you live in the Appalachians, it will, but pretty much every place else it won't. Um, and I would argue strongly that the Kama Yohanium, since it had no place whatsoever 
at the Council of Nicaea. Um, clearly is not the foundation of the biblical doctrine of the Trinity by any stretch of the imagination. So you might be hearing me say, and then why have you spent so much time on this? Because I seek to defend the text of the New Testament outside of our context. Outside of the Christian faith. Against unbelievers, whether religious or, or non-religious. Unbelievers. And so, it is important. We need to have a consistent methodology. But it needs to be a methodology. And that's why I said there were two textual critics there who each had a differing methodology, Peter Gurry and James Snap Jr. It probably would have been better to just have them talk and to flesh out the specific differences between them. I think that would have been useful. It, that happened a little bit. But there was a third. And I say third, not a third textual critical position. But there was a third person participating. And that, of course, was Dr. Jeffrey Riddle, whom we have addressed many times in this program, and played his statements. And back in early December, I believe it was, I posted, you may recall, we, we dealt with the text and canon conference that they had, and we, we played audio, and we interacted with what was being said, and we made the argument that TR onlyism, it's not confessionalism, this is not what the confession teaches, it is not what the confession teaches. And I think we'll see that today. It is a minority, extreme interpretation of the confessional text that is in no way, shape, or form demand by any meaningful interpretation of those texts. But it calls itself confessionalism. I, I hate that because it makes the 1689 look bad. Like the 1689 is saying, hey, you know what? God providentially brought the printing press into existence, and then he providentially dropped these certain manuscripts in Erasmus's hand, and a few others in Stephanus's hand, and a few others in Bayes's hand, and, and the result of all of that, even though that was a reconstruction situation, even though anybody who's read anything about Erasmus knows that Erasmus over and over said, ah, leave it up to the reader. And, and Jeffrey Riddle likes to talk about the Build-A-Bear, Build-A-Bear Greek text. That's what we have. Erasmus is going, ah, leave it up to the reader. <laughs> he was doing the exact same thing. Doesn't matter. There is no consistency here. Absolutely no consistency whatsoever. You have a different standard for everybody but yourselves. TR onlyism is King James onlyism with one step of Greek thrown in the middle, but it functions in the exact same mindset. And we will see this. We will see in a few moments Jeffrey Riddle saying, when you're reading the Texas Receptus, when you read this, you're reading the Autographa. Even though we can go to Ephesians 3, 9 and go, no, they, they're, once you've made that commitment, as we pointed out in this conversation, the facts don't matter. There's, there's, there's no, there is no fact that could be shown to Jeffrey Riddle in this conversation that would change his mind. And he admitted it. it yeah. And so Peter Gurry is like, so why, do we, why are we talking about this? What's the use in talking about this? Well, don't you want to convince me? How can I? You've, you've made up your mind. And, and all facts are irrelevant to you. And it was so plainly clear. Very, very useful. Even though, as far as I could tell, the host of the program was on Riddle's side, which is really interesting. Uh, but there, that's what this is, this is all about. And so there were only two positions presented. The third position is not a textual critical position. And in fact, we're going to hear Jeffrey Riddle say, we're not trying to reconstruct the text. We believe the text has been preserved. So the point is, from their perspective, this printed text and as James Snap kept saying, the majority of church history didn't have a printing press. How can we have a view of the text that basically could not have possibly been held by anyone before 1500? 
How, how can you say that's the only position to hold when the vast, when, when the, when the council of Nicaea hashed out vitally important things about the person of Christ and they didn't have this and there is no evidence that this is what they were using. How can you dismiss one? The thing that really, really, really was shown in this video is the a historical nature of Riddle's position. I'm not going to call it confessionalism. It's not confessionalism. It's not even close to confessionalism. It's it's a it's a modern TR traditionalism. That's all it is. But it is utterly a historical. It it does not care what the historical evidence is. It doesn't care what's been discovered since the Reformation. It doesn't care about what's going on at the Council of Nicaea or Chalcedon. It doesn't matter what text Gottschalk had in his hands. It doesn't matter about Wycliffe or Hus. It doesn't matter about all that stuff is irrelevant. What it does do in a frightening fashion is elevate the Reformation to a period of revelation. Now that's scary. Because I've met Calvinists who would go that far. You want hyper-confessionalism? You want to see the danger of not recognizing... Preaching here again, sorry. Two years, not quite two years ago. Uh, no, it was over two years ago. Good grief, has it been that long ago? When we took the cruise, not the cruise, the trip, to Germany. I came back and I told y'all that one of the things that startled our people was how brutally honest I was about the deficiencies of the reformers. First night in Berlin, in my lecture, I just lay out the reality that I know that the men, especially you know, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, would never have extended the right hand of fellowship to me. They probably would have had me minimally kicked out of the city. If not that, imprisoned. If not that, executed. And I know that. And I can still appreciate what God did with him, but... I also recognize that when I read their writings, I'm going to encounter things that are going to trouble me. I, I was reminded about this. Um, oh yeah, I was going to do this. I didn't do it. Um, I, I'm getting a, a bunch of people writing to me who obviously don't know we're on the air right now. Um, <laughs> um, so, there's a bunch of stuff going on, so I, I'm not I'm not angry with them. I'm just saying, sorry guys, I can't exactly respond right now. We're a little busy. Uh, there was a, a certain individual who made some comments about Reformed Baptists recently. And one of the terms that he used was protest, Protestant. And I know it's been a couple of years now, but I, I pointed out back then, and I'll point out again, People go, well, you know, we are Protestants, and so it's our nature to protest. That's not where the term came from. When we don't know our own history, we end up saying really silly things. That's not where it came from. I can't tell you how many people I've heard say that. Where'd the term come from? There are things called diets, the diet of Worms, the first diet of Worms, the second diet of Worms, the diet of Spire. These were what we would call meetings of Congress, in essence. Meetings of leaders in the Holy Roman Empire who had power over certain areas, electors. And after the Reformation, there was a period of time when the non-Catholics gained sway, and then when the Catholics got power back. And so... Charles, the emperor, once the Catholics get power back, he starts rolling back the freedoms that the non-Catholics have given themselves. And in the rules of the Holy Roman Empire, 
when the majority did something, the minority could file a protest, not a stand with a sign outside of Supreme Court protest, but it was a technical term in a legislative sense to try to protect rights of minority groups within the diet. And that's where the term came from. The non-Catholics protested the majority action in the diet of the Holy Roman Empire. It was a political thing. When I was young, I was honestly taught that on October 31st, 1517, there's a church service going on. It's a Roman Catholic church service. And Luther walked up to the door during the service and pounded the 95 theses on the door, interrupting the service. And that those 95 theses were all about how Rome was all wrong. And I guess I figured how Baptists were all right. <laughs> um, not knowing anything about church history as a young person. But that's the idea. No, that's not what happened. Not even close. As popular as it may be, as the pictures of him pointing to the nine, never happened. Never happened. And the term Protestant was a legal judicial term that had to do with, as I recall, it was a diet of spire, not even 1527, 1529, I forget which one it was. Didn't even bother looking it up. Look it up yourself. You'll see what I'm telling you is the historical fact. So there's all sorts of stuff about the Reformation. Uh, I was reading an article that a friend of mine posted uh, this week, and it was about Zwingli and Bollinger. Now, who are Zwingli and Bollinger? Zwingli was the reformer in Zurich. Now, Zwingli was only a reformer for, even if you put him absolutely concurrently with Luther, he's probably just a little bit afterwards. He claimed he was earlier, but let's say 1518. When does he die? Dies at the Battle of Kappel in 1531. He does not have a long period of time. And so it's relatively simple to find stuff in his theology that we would go, hmm. Yes, a reformer's theology. There's all sorts of stuff in Luther that most Reformed people would go, ah, nah, nah. and of course, Lutheranism is Luther interpreted through Melanchthon and through centuries of interpretation after that. Um, so there's all sorts of stuff you can find in Luther. But Zwingli held to a form of inclusivism. He did. Now, we look at inclusivism today, and we go, blah, 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 until we read Zwingli, who we respect, even though he drowned Anabaptists off the bridge there in Zurich, um, we, we have an exceptionally selective view of church history. We really do. And it's because of this that when people, it, it, when, when people don't realize the breadth of of theological expressions that have been given out there. You go back and you start reading people in history and you're just left going, I, if you think that what you're going to read is like picking up an R.C. Sproul book and it's going to be everything that I believe is going to be said by someone way back then, um, you have, you're going to be in for a surprise. You're going to be in for a big surprise, which is why Sola Scriptura is so important. But it also helps provide a context for Sola Scriptura. Because while we do stand upon the shoulders of giants, we do not stand upon their shoulders by accepting every single thing that they said. What becomes clearer and clearer over time is the consistency of Scripture, not the consistency of human beings. And the only way for me to communicate all this is to do a massive study in church history and the theology that comes through that and the, the, the threads and everything else. And 
we we would have no audience left uh, at the end of all that. I can assure you. Um, so the the one of the one of the problems that we are that we are facing big time here um, is that in Jeffrey Riddle's um, position, there is a hyper exaltation of the Reformation in such a fashion that, as will be pointed out in the discussion, doing textual criticism was okay up until then. Once this came into existence, we're done. No, no reason for it anymore. Uh, doesn't matter what manuscripts are found. This is it. So there was a providential action of God. And it's and when you ask why then, why not Nicaea? Why not Chalcedon? Why not a period after that, after the Reformation? Why not why not the Great Awakening? Why not the, the conservative resurgence in the Southern Baptist Convention? No, no, it was the Reformation. And yeah, the reformers never talked about doing this. And they never said they were doing this. And nobody after them really believed that this had actually happened until us. We've come up with this. But, but yeah, that's when it happened. And that's our final authority. And that's why you should read what you read in your Testament. And there are people going, hey, that sounds pretty good. And I just want to go, do you really want to take that out into the world? Because you can't, you can't even have a conversation within conservative Christianity with that as your foundation. You think you're going to take that outside? To anybody else? And I guess some people are saying, yeah, 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 we'll do that. We'll do that. Um, is there a reason why? Oh, okay. All right. So um, I am really, really happy to announce that this program that I got last year, that I used a couple times, the one feature that I wanted in it, and I haven't been, I, it's not like I've opened it up every time it's been, I mean, who really even looks at what updates anymore? I mean, I mean, I, my iPad, you know, I open it up once a week and there's, there's a hundred and there's 117 updates to do. Um, but they did an update and it now does exactly what I wanted it to do, which was, I can now watch a video and then I might type in a note. I can go back later on and just click on the note and it takes the video to exactly where it was. So it's a, it's almost as good as audio note taker, but now for video. So it's like, Yay! Uh, it's called Note Studio. If you're if you're wondering, uh, let me click on it here and make sure that, yeah, Note Studio. Um, so when someone does a good program, we'll let people know. Uh, so it's called Note Studio. That's what we're going to be using. And so here is, let's start off with Jeffrey Riddle um, talking about. And, and by the way, um, the, things have had quieted down a great deal since December. The reason being, I was blocked by everybody in that group. That's what I was going to say. It was November 3rd you reviewed this. So it was a month earlier. Okay. Yeah, but but then, um, well, not didn't review this. I reviewed the text can stuff. And then early December is when I published the PDF of the material in Ephesians 3.9. I got blocked by everybody. And then I was informed that a two-hour video response was put out, but I've never seen it. So they don't want the other side to interact anymore. Uh, they, they've just got their their thing. And so, yeah, it gets pretty quiet because you've just got a little group back there and behind closed doors. And, you know, they don't want to debate. That's what they said at the at the, at the the Texas Canon thing. They, they don't want to debate. It's like, good, I'm glad. I'm, I would encourage you not to. Um, but uh, this happened, and so... And there is a clear call to accept this perspective so as to benefit the church. And I think it's anything but a benefit to the church. Um, so let's listen to the definition, because each of the gentlemen were given an opportunity to define their position at the start, which is good. So let's listen to some of, uh, some of that here at the start. Baptist Confession of Faith. This confessional text position holds that the authoritative text of the Bible is found in the Masoretic texts of the Hebrew Old Testament and the Textus Receptus of the Greek New Testament. 
We furthermore believe that it is best to use vernacular translations of the Bible based on these texts and to use a formal correspondence method in making such translations. This view does not hold that it is our task to reconstruct the elusive original autograph or autographs, but it contends that the true text has been faithfully kept pure in all ages by God's singular care and providence. Okay, so you don't have to reconstruct it. It's always been there. So this has... This, this was at Nicaea. This is at Chalcedon. Um, the, Wycliffe had it. Huss had it. I, if it's been pure in every age, that's going to come out, and he's going to say, no, 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 no. But what else could it mean? If you're saying, we don't have to reconstruct it. Every word in this book, this is the Texas Receptus, was reconstructed by Erasmus, Stephanus, and Beza. So one of the definitional incoherencies of the TR-only position as being expressed here, is, okay, that was reconstructed, but that was the last time. Well, but it w couldn't have been reconstructed if it has been preserved the whole time, see? So words tend to get really squishy here. So our method stresses preservation rather than reconstruction. And I think that differentiates my position from both that of Peter and that of James. We believe that there is what Richard Brash has called a practical univocity between the divine originals, the autographs, and what has been preserved in the copies, the apographs, best represented by the printed editions of the traditional text. So when... Now, now listen very carefully here. Listen to what is said here. We read the received text. We are reading the autographs, and we do not have to reconstruct them. Okay, so... Uh, I, I want I want you to hear that I because sometimes well you're misrepresenting them and da 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 um, okay let here and what has been preserved in the copies the apographs best represented by the printed editions of the traditional text so when we read the received text we are reading the autographs and we do not have to reconstruct them with the Protestant reform so if this is the autograph then anything that is found since 1633 is automatically evil because it, if, if, it, if it's a departure from anything in here. So, so any of the papyri, you know, as, as he calls them, the much vaunted papyri, et cetera, et cetera, we don't need any of that. There's no reason to study that stuff. Not in the sense of establishing, because here's the autograph. This is it. Case closed. Where, where have you seen that before? You saw it in London when I debated Adnan Rashid. And Adnan holds up the Arabic Quran. And despite the fact that I've pointed out that there are variations between the the text that was originally collated and that of Uthman, his idea is, hey, if this is what Uthman had, good enough for us, this is it. No questions, we're done. Same attitude. It's the exact same attitude. Um, and hence, there can be no meaningful dialogue between those two positions, because it's just, no, we're, we're not concerned about the facts. We're, our position is not based upon evidence. Our position is based upon the conclusion that we've already made. And, uh, and that's how that works. Okay? So, um, we're reading the autographs. Do not have to reconstruct them. All right. Let's get into the discussion um, between all the guys. And when I get into the second video, I didn't have time to take notes in the second video. So I'm going to use a different program to play it, and I'll be able to play it faster. I haven't found a way yet to play this faster. I, I, that, would, that would be my next hoped-for <laughs> uh, feature. Uh, would be a 1.1, 1.2 uh, type thing. I can do that with QuickTime, uh, but I can't do it within this program yet. There, there might be a way, and I just haven't found it yet. So we'll, we'll see. But let's... Um, 
in this next section, and I remember uh, Dr. Riddle had quoted from Dr. Gurry's book that he co-authored with Tommy Wasserman at the Texas Canon thing uh, last year. And he had made the argument that what Dr. Gurry and Wasserman was saying, they're admitting that there is so little early evidence that if this was a national park, that you it wouldn't be a topographical map, it would be a watercolor painting. And I didn't bring the book with me, but uh, if you actually go read the Wasserman Gurry book, you will see that they're talking about genealogical stomata. They're talking about the, the, the whole reason for CBGM is that we have a manuscript tradition where the large majority of the manuscripts have been lost over time. That's, that's what you have with anything from the ancient world. And so how do we establish relationships, not between manuscripts, but between texts? CBGM deals with texts, not manuscripts. That is a distinction that the vast majority of human beings just don't make. It's non-intuitive. It's counterintuitive. But if you think about, you know, what, what, what we wish is we had original, this copy, this copy, this copy, this copy, and then this one was copied over here, and then we could trace this line, and then this line, and this line, and then sometimes there's pollution where someone has two copies, and then the, the line goes down. We wish we had all those steps, but what we've got are just one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. And what we're trying to do is recognize what those lines are on the basis of coherence. And there's something called pre-genealogical coherence, which is just... It's just the, the rough numbers, the, 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 well, it's not rough in the sense of an estimate, but just the basic numbers of if you take this manuscript and this manuscript and you compare them where they differ, uh, what's the percentage of agreements versus disagreements? Just how much, how much do they agree with one another? And then the more complicated form of coherence, genealogical coherence, is when you then include something called text flow. And text flow is somewhat subjective. Uh, it's not, I think, nearly as subjective as some people would automatically think, but editors look at the readings and they make decisions that say, this reading is derived from this reading. In some instances, that's really easy to do. In others, it's not. But I'd say in the large majority, it's pretty easy to do. And so the text flow can give you a general direction between two manuscripts. Which manuscript has readings that tend to look more like they came from the other one? Now, you can go online. You can, I didn't, I'm not going to do this right now. You can go online and you can access the CBGM materials and you can create the, the text flow diagrams where you can see between these two manuscripts, 70% of the time, the text goes, the, the flow goes this direction, 30% the other direction. Well, that's not over scientific in the sense of specific. It can't be because we're dealing with handwritten manuscripts. But it does give you a trend upon which you can then start to create relationships. When you compare chapter after chapter, and this was some manuscripts, book after book, and you start, the computer is able to start seeing these relationships. So the point in the book that Gurry and Wasserman wrote was that CBGM is not going to give us a computer spit out like when Apollo 13 was coming back to Earth. They're this far away at this angle and so they need to burn at this thrust for this long. Okay, that's, those are specific numbers. You miss those numbers and you either burn up in the atmosphere, or bounce off and die in outer space. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, we're not talking about that kind of computer analysis. That's, the data does not allow that kind of specificity. 
but it can start giving you the watercolor picture of what the relationships are rather than the topographical one that says this high, this high, et cetera, et cetera. So their point had to do with the production of local stomata, global stomata, coherence. It's a CBGM thing. Now, you would think, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you think that when you're talking to the author that you might accept the author's interpretation of what the author wrote? Now, I've, I've experienced where that doesn't happen. <laughs> Remember when I, when I debated um, Robertson Jenis in the late 90s and he quoted from The Fatal Flaw? And then I'm like, but that's not what I meant. And he wouldn't accept my interpretation of my own words. So I have encountered people who were actually, who actually thought that they knew what I meant in what I wrote better than I knew what I meant in what I wrote. So there are people like that out there. Um, you just hope you don't get stuck with them, neck, you know, when you're in the window seat. Um, anyway, um, so here Dr. Riddle is quoting from Dr. Gurry's book, and he won't accept Dr. Gurry's correction of his misunderstanding. And in the process, Riddle demonstrates he does not understand CBGM. He does not understand how CBGM works. He doesn't. That's just, that's just fact. He may criticize it. Everyone so far that I've encountered that like made fun of CBGM couldn't tell me the difference between pre-genealogical and genealogical coherence either. And if you don't, if you can't tell those, you don't know what CBGM is about. So let's, let's watch and learn, watch and learn. Um, you know, I, I read, uh, when I was at the Texan Canon conference, I, uh, last October, I, I read a quote from Gurry and Wasserman's, um, book, uh, in which they, uh, talked about the difficulties, the challenges just historically of attempting to reconstruct anything given the paucity of evidence. And um, if I could uh, read just a little bit of what they said, this is from Peter Gurry and Tommy Watson's book on the CBGM. They said, this pen 12, what is left behind are fragments, chance survivals from the past. We are trying to piece together the puzzle with only some pieces. In the case of textual criticism, this means that we have only a selection of the manuscripts that once existed, and sometimes incomplete scripts. And, and then they go on to uh, say, it is more like a watercolor painting of a great national park than a topographical map. We might be able to identify key landmarks from the watercolor, but we would not want to use it to find our way through the forest. Yeah, can and, I clarify that, Jeff? Sure. Because I have a feeling you're going to go somewhere it was not intended. <laughs> when yeah. we're saying it's a watercolor, right, what are we talking about is a watercolor? Are we saying the original text is a watercolor? No, we're not. What we're saying is attempts to map the relationship of manuscripts genealogically that map is more like a watercolor map than a detailed topographic map of how our manuscripts are related. So we're not, if, if that quote is given in, in the context of saying, see, they don't think we can get the original text, that's just a misreading of what we're saying. What we're talking about is genealogy, right? And attempts to map the relationship of manuscripts that we have, which is something that's been done for hundreds of years in text criticism, right? And what we're warning against people is saying, hey, these diagrams in the CBGM look really detailed, be careful that you don't read them as some kind of, you know, photocopy of what actually happened, right? They're not. They're not that. They can't be that specific because we've lost too many, too many manuscripts in the process. And, and again, the problem, we don't know how many we've lost, right? Well, here, I, that's I, not I, a metaphor I, about the original text. I, I, can, I can test out the authorial intent, intent because I'm talking to the author. Can, and so I, I, know, I, exactly. appreciate, I appreciate your clarification there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but in the context, though, you were also talking about the paucity of evidence. Sure. We, only have, I mean, some of the, we only have some of the pieces. Right. And it's, it's something some of the I've pieces really for been, what, though, Jeff? Some of the pieces for what? 
What's the some, puzzle in our some, metaphor? Some of the pieces for reconstructing the text. No, no. See, no. Some of the puzzles for reconstructing the relationship of manuscripts. But isn't that reconstructing the text? Oh, no, we, you can reconstruct the text without knowing how every single manuscript is related to every other single manuscript. Of course you can. Yeah. The better we can do it, the better confidence we might but, have. But isn't the purpose of isn't the purpose of reconstructing the relationships among manuscripts to trace a line of descent to get back to as close as you can the original? If you know who my parents are, does it matter that you don't know who their grandchildren are? We're not. Ding 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 ding. Now listen. Now now listen to Riddle's response. Because he does not understand CBGM. He does not understand the concept of coherence. He does not understand stomata. He doesn't understand how this process works, even though he said he read the book. Um, and what I think this might illustrate is how tradition, you know, if you think that CBGM is some evil, terrible, horrible thing, and people think that since I've talked about it and I've tried to introduce people to it, I'll be talking about it uh, up in Gardnerville, Men Menden uh, this, this weekend. I'll be doing a a layman's introduction to CBGM, just to, just surface level. Don't worry, I'm not going to bore you to tears, but I want you to understand basically what's going on with it. Um, because I've spoken positively about it, because at the very least, even if you don't like it, the, fa the, the amount of data that is now available to you, if you haven't played around with the CBGM modules for Axe, for example, and Lord, please, Mark, soon, please, quickly, um, then you, you've got, just got no idea how much information is, is available on the manuscripts and their relationship to one another. So if that's all it was, you could disagree with the underlying presuppositions, but the information's incredible. Um, I really appreciate the work that's got in the CBGM. My question is, let's improve it. Let's, let's make sure as to especially the history the the historical there is a there's a sense in which CBGM somewhat dehistoricizes the text it breaks the connection between the manuscript and the text that it contains and and the context in which it was written um and you know my work in that area is to find out does that really end up having a negative impact and and I haven't come to any conclusions on that yet um but the the, the point is you can come at something with such a negative bias that you end up not even hearing what's being said. And I think that's the case here. Uh, Dr. Riddle doesn't get, and he's talking to the author, okay? And the author's saying, I'm talking about genealogical relationships. I'm talking about the relationships of texts, not manuscripts, but texts to one another, determined by the analysis of their readings. And so he gives an answer. Let me back it up just a second here. He gives an answer about, can you know my grandparents without knowing their grandchildren, which is a relationship answer. Now listen to what Riddle says, because it demonstrates he doesn't understand what the answer was actually saying. Grandchildren are? We're not talking about people. We're talking about manuscripts. Uh, but we're talking about genealogy of manuscripts, right? So if you know who my parents are, does it matter if you don't know how their grandchildren are related? Okay. Dr. Curry is right. So he said the word manuscripts, which I'm sure he'll say it was late at night. Because um, <laughs> that's a that's a no-no. It's it's not manuscripts. It's it's text. But so did so did um and maybe he was just taking that from from Riddle. But the point is, here the author is telling somebody else, no, that's not what we're talking about. And it is inappropriate to apply our words to the reconstruction of the original text. We're talking about something else. But Dr. Riddle won't accept it. So is the purpose is the purpose then of CBGM just to describe existing manuscripts and well, what not? What else could it be? Did you hear what he said? What else could it be? Because you can't describe manuscripts that we don't possess, or texts that we do not possess. What else could it be? You know, this is a case where you got to deal with the cards you've been dealt. And one of the points here is that we have a deck of cards 
that is minimally 10 times taller than the deck they had in the 16th century. What do you do? Riddle's position says you get rid of all those cards you got since the 16th century. That's that's the, 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 the only possible logical outcome of what's being said. Well, what it, what it could be, what it would have been in the 20th century was an attempt to, to, to discover the autograph. No, he, he does not understand the point that's being expressed to him. He just doesn't. In the 20th century, it would have had to... See, there had been an earlier discussion about um, initial text, Ausgang's text, uh, autograph, et cetera, et cetera. And there had been an interesting conversation. Dr. Curry had pointed out, well, look, if you, if you don't like... One perspective, take take Tyndall House. They, they're, they're trying to get back to the to the autographs, et cetera, et cetera. There had been a discussion about that um, and disagreement over where all textual, you know, not all textual critics are on the same page as to what they're looking for. Dr. Gree had gone through how certain people have this perspective, certain people, you know, Michael Holmes versus this person, that person. It was interesting. I, I invite you to go listen to it. It's it's well worth the the uh, the time to do so. Um, but there is a, there seemingly in the TR only position, you have to, you have to conflate categories to get your system to work because those, those categories continue to be conflated even here. That, well, that's your initial text. So the one reconstructive text in the CBGM, as you may know, is what is the initial text. So there is one reconstructed text in the CBGM and it is the initial text, which again, the, uh, the editors of the ECM are explicit in saying they think there is no reason to think there is a gap between their reconstructed initial text, the A text, and the author's text. You uh, might think there's a reason to think there's a gap, but they don't. So now you see, I'm watching this. Are you watching this? No, I'm watching. I'm, I'm looking right above Peter Gurry, and there's poor James Snap, and and he's he's <laughs> he's like, I want to get in here. How do I get in here, James? You just got to get in there, guy. You, <laughs> In person, evidently on camera, James Snap is just way too nice. <laughs> you just gotta, you gotta time when you're gonna get. You've got to step on the last guy's last syllable in a situation like this. Okay, it's it's an acquired it's an acquired skill. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not making fun. I, I like I said, I was really really impressed with James Snap and all of this, and Peter Gurry, obviously. You know, that's but that's up to you. Yeah. Along the way to that text, though, is the extrapolation of relationships among manuscripts. Which is very important. I'm not trying to deny that, right? I'm just saying, it sounds like Jeff wants to read our metaphor there as the painting or the puzzle is the original text, and it's not. In the metaphor we're trying to use there, the, the painting or the puzzle is that map of manuscript relationships, right? In some textual traditions of, say, classical authors, you can, you can develop quite a detailed uh, genealogical map. I mean, I, I was focusing more. I, I was focusing more on your your emphasis in that passage, and I, we don't have to parse what you wrote. It's what you wrote, but your your emphasis in, on the in that passage on actually how little evidence we have. You say in the case of textual criticism that this means that we only have a selection of the manuscripts that once existed. Right. And sometimes incomplete manuscripts. And I, this is, right. it seems but we to still me have a be... lot. Right. And you only need one good one to have a good text. Because I always try to remind my students of that. Right. It's easy to think, oh, if only we had 10 more manuscripts. Well, I mean, sure. Who, which of us wouldn't want more manuscripts and more evidence to look at? But to have a good authoritative text, you only need one good authoritative manuscript. Right. And I think we have more than that. Agreed. Agreed. That's why that's why I believe with regard to affirmation of the Texas Receptus that looking at the empirical evidence and finding that uh, a passage isn't doesn't have a lot of ex extant external support doesn't necessarily negate its value or its authenticity. But what if there's a lot of extant but, evidence? But on with, the other side? But with this is, I see this as a challenge and I see I you know you guys are both you're both approaching things from a reconstructionist um, position. I'm the only person here that's not coming from a reconstructionist position, but a preservationist position. But this seems to be a fundamental problem with the reconstruction method is 
you you only have the things that are extant. Now think about this for just a minute. <clears throat> Where did this come from? It's TR. How much material did Erasmus and Stephanus and Beza, because they're, those are the only meaningful inputs. There, there's no, I'm unaware of any meaningful manuscript input before the 1633 Elsevier edition, which is pretty much, pretty much the TR develops between the initial edition from Erasmus. So it's what, about 115 years, give or take round numbers. Um, so there's, there's no, there's no more manuscript input. So how many manuscripts do we have here? in comparison to how many manuscripts we have here. So the guy who says you need to use this that had 20, 25 very late manuscripts, none before the, the turn of the millennium is complaining that the editors of this are using, uh, 250 times that amount of, of material. Uh, yeah, I guess around uh, about 250 and, and not, not even including versional stuff. So let's just stick with the Greek 250 times that amount of material that goes as much as 800 years earlier than the earliest used here. And this is based on few manuscripts and, but this is preserved. And I think, I think he gets away with that because this doesn't, this just, Floats down out of heaven. This, 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 this is providentially, see, and they're, they're, the angels were involved, you know, um, and you don't have to worry about all of those times where Erasmus said, eh, it could be this, could be that, you know, you don't have to worry about when, when Beza goes, well, there's multiple uh, attestation for this when he actually only had Beze Cantabrigensis and was looking at Stephanos and Stephanos also had that, but he didn't know Stephanos had that. And all that, all that historical stuff that demonstrates that this is a reconstructed text, we don't have to worry about that. That has been providentially brought down on the uh, angelic wings, and so it doesn't have to fit in the same categories as, as this here. Let's see, so there you go to study and you know when it comes to i i, I read uh in, in thinking about getting together today i read james's very helpful research okay next section is comma johannium that's very important uh i think that really illustrated some stuff so uh before we do that we've already gone for an hour and a half and so i warned rich about this <laughs> And I said, remember those old commercials we had from around 2002? Uh, we still got those someplace. And so we're going to um, take a, a brief break, stretch our legs, um, and uh, we'll, we'll come back and we'll, we'll continue this. So let's, let's jump into that. Breaking news from the White House and the issue, gay marriage. For a lot of people, you know, the, the word marriage was something that evokes very powerful traditions, religious beliefs. I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. The NAACP has passed a resolution endorsing gay marriage as a civil right. Uh, this comes two weeks after the president announced his support for same-sex marriage. Under the guise of tolerance, our culture today grants alternative lifestyle status to homosexuality. Anyone opposing or questioning this today is quickly shouted down, called a bigot, a homophobe, a hate monger, threatened and accused of discrimination. It's become commonplace to see people who take a biblical stand against homosexuality ostracized to the point of losing their job. How soon will it be before we will also see people losing their freedom? Now more than ever, Christians need to be equipped to be an approved workman of God, correctly dividing the word of truth as we are told 
told in 2 Timothy 2.15. Dr. James White and Pastor Jeffrey Neal have partnered to bring you their book, The Same-Sex Controversy. If you are a Christian, this book is just one of the tools you'll need to be prepared to give a proper defense of the faith in the face of the unrighteous onslaught we face today. The authors write for all who want to better understand the Bible's teaching on this subject, explaining and defending the foundational biblical passages that deal with homosexuality, including Genesis, Leviticus, and Romans. In a straightforward and loving manner, they appeal to those caught up in a homosexual lifestyle to repent and return to God's plan for his people. The Same-Sex Controversy, Defending and Clarifying the Bible's Message about Homosexuality. Get your copy today from the bookstore at aomen.org. And don't forget to search for other resources like debates and past dividing lines dealing with this very provocative issue. And remember, theology matters. Hello, everyone. This is Rich Pierce. In a day and age where the gospel is being twisted into a man-centered self-help program, the need for a no-nonsense presentation of the gospel has never been greater. I am convinced that a great many go to church every Sunday, yet they have never been confronted with their sin. Alpha and Omega Ministries is dedicated to presenting the gospel in a clear and concise manner, making no excuses. Man is sinful and God is holy. That sinful man is in need of a perfect Savior, and Jesus Christ is that perfect Savior. We are to come before the Holy God with an empty hand of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Alpha and Omega takes that message to every group that we deal with, while equipping the body of Christ as well. Support Alpha and Omega Ministries and help us to reach even more with the pure message of God's glorious grace. Thank you. Answering those who claim that only the King James Version is the Word of God, James White, in his book, The King James Only Controversy, examines allegations that modern translators conspired to corrupt Scripture and lead believers away from true Christian faith. In a readable and responsible style, author James White traces the development of Bible translations, old and new, and investigates the differences between new versions and the authorized version of 1611. You can order your copy of James White's book, The King James Only Controversy, by going to our website at www.aomin.org. More than any time in the past, Roman Catholics and Evangelicals are working together. They are standing shoulder to shoulder against social evils. They are joining across denominational boundaries in renewal movements. And many Evangelicals are finding the history, tradition, and grandeur of the Roman Catholic Church appealing. This newfound rapport has caused many evangelical leaders and laypeople to question the age-old disagreements that have divided Protestants and Catholics. Aren't we all saying the same thing in a different language? James White's book, The Roman Catholic Controversy, is an absorbing look at current views of tradition and scripture, the papacy, the mass, purgatory and indulgences, and Marian doctrine. James White points out the crucial differences that remain regarding the Christian life and the heart of the gospel itself that cannot be ignored. Order your copy of The Roman Catholic Controversy by going to our website at aomin.org. We are listening to an encounter that took place a little while ago on Talking Christianity Apologetics. There were two textual critics uh, involved, uh, Dr. Peter Gurry and James Snap Jr., um, who I just noticed. I just, I, I'm just now looking at this. There's a Captain America shield on the wall behind James Snap. I didn't, I didn't see that. Who would have known? And... I'm thinking that might that almost looks like a like a weight rack on the right hand side. Hmm. I had not I had not looked, but uh, they went late into the night. They went to like one o'clock in the morning because they're on the East Coast, and um, so yeah. But we we're listening to a discussion of textual variants, uh, and because remember what I've said for a long time. TR-onlyism 
is not a textual critical methodology. TR onlyism cannot produce a text, it can only promote a text. It has to have a pre existent text that it ignores its history of. It, it cannot defend its history because its history, to, to come into existence, all the historical evidence demonstrates that this is a reconstructed text. There is no single manuscript in the world that reads like this. Therefore, this is a reconstructed text. So for you to stand around and say, we reject reconstructionism, if you believe in reconstructionism, all your people can become Roman Catholics, which is going to be said later on. Uh, well, not said, that's why people are leaving and becoming Roman Catholics. When your own text is reconstructed, is one of the many incoherencies of TR onlyism, uh, which is why it's indefensible in debate, as is being demonstrated, as will be demonstrated, especially uh, in this. Now, what's about to start is the discussion of the Kam Yohanium. And this is what's interesting here is that when talking about the Pricabe Adultery, which is normally called the PA, uh, longer ending a mark. Um, James Snap, who has majoritarian emphasis in his weighting of sources in his eclectic methodology, um, has written in defense of the PA and long running a mark. But he has also written, and this is where he's consistent anyways, uh, he's also written in demonstration of where the Kama Yohanium came from. And he's right. Um, the time period in which it, ar it arises, it arises in Latin manuscripts. Um, it is a gloss, an explanation. Many of these manuscripts very frequently have glosses in them. Um, what's interesting um, is the fact that there isn't an interpenetration into the Greek manuscript tradition from the Latin for quite some time, even after it has become prevalent in the Latin manuscripts, which is a good thing, actually, when you think about it. Anyway, so on the comma Johannium, you have Gurry and Snap on the same page, basically, uh, against Riddle, whereas on the others. But again, just, just remember what I said earlier. You list these texts, the PA, long writing of, 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 of Mark, they do not change the faith. They just don't. This has to be emphasized. Um, that does not mean that they are not important things to study, but they do not change the faith. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's listen to some of the Kam Yohanium stuff. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to have to cut some things out, uh, or we're going to be here for a very, very, very long time. I think YouTube has a limitation. So, article on the coma yoneum, and you know there are only what five manuscripts. This is the first John five seven, and that's not a lot. I mean, I want to base a position on what we don't have, though. So I'm just saying, I, I'm just, on what we I'm, do have. I'm, I'm just saying, I think, I think a lot of people who are laymen, um, when we talk about this, a lot of times they're thinking, well, there are thousands of manuscripts that exclude the, the coma that are, you know, and we have ones from the first century, the second century, the third century. And what would we need to convince you it's not original, Jeff? Because I, I kind of suspect there's nothing that would, right? Given your position. <laughs> Probably not. Now, to catch that, to catch that, um, what would you need, Jeff, to be convinced that it was not original? And then Peter's like, I, I'm assuming there's probably really nothing. And Jeff's like, yeah. Yeah, I'm not open to discussion of this. I, I mean, obviously, for Peter and I, if... All of a sudden, we found, let's say we, let's say they're renovating a, um, an ancient site in Italy. 
And because of the way in which a room was sealed off, uh, it was sealed off with almost no humidity in it. And hence, there are manuscripts in there from the middle of the third century. Greek manuscripts have not been touched and have survived. That's why they survive in the desert. They don't survive in other places. And James Knapp made a very, I, th I think it's one of the most important points on that subject, which we haven't gotten into. But again, um, this, this could be the indication of the soon coming of Armageddon is that I've said numerous very kind things about James Knapp today. Um, <laughs> I think we would actually enjoy having dinner together. I really do. Because uh, because his just his beard alone is just pretty, pretty super stuff. But I do want to find out the, about the Captain America thing. <laughs> so it's still there. Anyway, um, or, so let's say we found um, in that treasure trove of manuscripts, three manuscripts of 1 John from the 3rd century that contain the Kama Yohanium as a natural part of the text, not written in the margin, direct natural part of the text. For Peter Gurry and I, and for James Snap, that would be highly relevant, irrelevant to Jeffrey Riddle. But what if we found the same treasure trove, ancient manuscripts from a location we've never found stuff from before? First John, third century, papyri, no comma to be found. Any impact on Jeffrey Riddle? Nope. Because his position is not based upon facts. It's not based upon evidence. It's I've got my text. I'll do with it whatever I need to do with it to defend it. So the rest of us would be impacted by that. And this is one of their arguments. Well, I don't want my New Testament changing. We want a New Testament that reflects what the apostles wrote. That's the big difference. That is the big difference. The TR only position is saying, this is what the apostles wrote. Don't question it. Don't question it. This is it. You're not allowed to. And how is that different than Adnan Rashid holding up his Arabic Quran saying, here it is. Don't question it. Um, Arguments from authority have that, that, that nature. I mean, yeah, so why because, does it matter? It's a red herring. Well, no, it matters because the, the point is that... Yeah, that, that got split up, and I, I apologize. Uh, so... Red herring. Well, okay. no, it matters because... Right, give your position. <laughs> okay, here we and What would we need to convince you it's not original, Jeff? Because I, I kind of suspect there's nothing that would, right? Given your position, <laughs> probably not. I yeah, mean, so why because, does it matter? It's a red herring. Well, well, no, it matters because the the point is that there's not enough extant evidence empirically to verify but what, what is what is authentic. But, and, uh, and why so would we why should be, you get to tell me how much evidence is enough? I mean, we have hundreds of manuscripts that don't have it in Greek. And none of them are pre Middle Ages, right? So I think we don't have hundreds. I mean, we we most of them are most of them are after after the tenth century. Well, yeah, and there are okay. so, I mean, like, like, seven hundred. Yeah. So I'm yeah, just but, saying it's but not. But then there are hundreds a lot. after that. But then there are hundreds after that that don't have it. Hundreds. So if you want to uh, say the text has been kept here in all ages, hundreds, maybe a two hundred fifty. I think. No, no, we have we have oh, over five hundred oh, manuscripts. Just first, just you know. to, we got the quantities involved. Uh, yeah. yeah, about about five have it in the text, and there are little quirks mm -hmm. even within that text of whether they do have the articles or that they don't. So if you're looking and you're saying, if, if you're going to say that the Westminster Confession of Faith requires this, this, the Kama Yohannium to be preserved exactly down to the last detail, the form must be kept pure in all ages, and that means exact replication, then... No, it doesn't mean that's, that's the problem, though. That kept pure in all ages from a from a confessional perspective doesn't mean replicated 
exactly. So, in so all you're ages. saying it doesn't refer to the exact replication of the text? Does it mean just a, uh, something that gets across? Uh, no, it, it means the divine preservation of it, that God preserved it. Even if you don't have, even if you don't have, even if you don't, even if you don't have, even if you don't have an extant replication of it. Um, so would you? Are, is your position? See, now, the James Snap is is expressing the same frustration that we all would, because words are supposed to have meanings. If you're going to say it's pure in all ages, if you're going to say it has been preserved in all ages. And then turn around and say, well, okay, yeah, there are lots of differences between when, when it does finally show up, there, you know, whether the article's there. And that's one of the things I, meant, I, I noticed, and I've talked about this before. Just before uh, Codex Monfortianus was published online uh, in high-quality digital photography, um, I had access to it in the reading room at the Trinity College in Dublin. And one of the things that I immediately noticed in, in looking at it was the variations that exist between even that which was relevant to Erasmus's insertion of it into his third edition, even that and what's in the TR. So where is it perfect? Uh, how, where, where, does that, where does that come from? How, how, do, how do these words have meaning? And of course, snap not being from a Reformed perspective, is probably sitting there going, I'm really getting tired of having a, uh, a Baptist confession that was uh, primarily, in most of its aspects, built off of the Westminster Confession with the Savoy and a few things like that, having influence later on from the 17th century, um, determining what the final text of the New Testament is supposed to be when none of those individuals who wrote that were textual scholars, or he even had access to one five hundredth of the information that I have. Um, and I, that, there is a reason to be frustrated by that. There, there really is. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Sorry, Sorry go ahead. Uh, just a moment. How can you say that you're a preservationist when you're arguing for readings that are not preserved? <laughs> They are preserved. They They're have not the Greek preserved. text. We're talking about a Greek text. That's what the Westminster Confession of Faith is talking about, isn't it? Well, Does they it were, say the Greek text, they, except where it's not preserved in the Greek, but it is preserved in these little, very, these little versional passages that, that we kind of like. That's not what it says. It's talking about exact replication. If you're going to say, on doctrinal grounds, it's been kept pure in all ages, and that means the exact form, how can you then just... Throw away all the Greek evidence that you have that point to the different direction. It, Might means be it, it means that it was preserved providentially so that it, 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 so that it could be preserved in a text that would be printed in, during the Reformation and post-Reformation period, become the basis for all the vernacular translations How of the Bible, up with become, this position become useful in the spread of the gospel. Wasn't the Syria? Yeah, okay, you couldn't you couldn't hear what James Snap said there. Well, yes, he does need a better microphone. Um, but um, what he said was, how could it have been preserved prior to the printing press? He's going to expand upon this a little bit later on, but he makes a very very good point. The TR onlyism can only exist after the printing press. It, it ha there's no other way to do it because the reality that everyone faced prior to the printing press was the existence of variation because there are no two manuscripts that are identical to one another. That it's just, and, and people today are so accustomed to cut and paste and, 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 and to our modern situation that, that they, they struggle to wrap their mind around what it was like before the modern period when you did not have that photocopy possibility. And that's the, the TR, TR onlyism is a modernistic. It, it it depends upon modernistic presuppositions that are that no one before the invention of the printing press would have ever been able to comprehend. Wait, you're you're telling me that the final authority is going to be in a text made by a machine a hundred years from now. That's not identical to any of the manuscripts we have right now. No, they, they, they wouldn't have any any way to even begin to cogitate upon such a thing. And that's why I say it's ahistorical, because it doesn't care 
about what manuscripts were being carried by the Church Fathers at the Council of Nicaea, who are dealing with issues such as the very deity of Jesus Christ. They don't care. No, they don't care what was going on back then. That's, that's way, 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 way back then. That's, that's too far. No, no, no. Reformation. The guys we read all the time. This is what happens when you're Reformed and you lose connection with the history before that. It really is. It really is. It's dangerous. Vernacular oh, translation? But you, we're, we're, the point was that James to talk about the number of manuscripts that hold the, the coma. Actually, it is preserved, that particular example, in some extent manuscripts. The point was to talk about the paucity of early manuscripts of any sort that are witnesses to First John. And, you know, I, I this settled on me a couple of years ago when I heard Dan Wallace talking about the coma Ioannaeum. And um, at the time, I hadn't looked much at it and don't consider myself an expert necessarily about it now. But I simply asked him, well, how many, how many manuscripts do we have? How many early manuscripts do we have of 1 John in a Q&A on, in a presentation. Okay, I, there's some other things. Let me let me show how this works. Um, I'm very happy I can now do this. And boom. Question. Yeah, go ahead. In your, I, and I'd really like to hear your answer on this. Given your position on your, your own position being confessional, right? So yeah. the impression I've gotten from talking to confessional bibliologists is that there's no evidence that could change your conclusion because your conclusion doesn't start from evidence, right? Is, in your mind, is there any point in people on your side actually talking to people on my side. Because usually when it comes down to it... Now, now let's remember something, folks. <clears throat> Once... Remember, when they announced they were going to do the Text and Canon Conference, I offered to fly there at my own cost to debate their two primary speakers on this topic. What? Yeah, he's, oh yeah, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Rowe is one of the two of them. Um, on this topic, to start their conference off. And of course, they said no. And then once the audio recordings were distributed, were made available, and I started interacting with what was said, and then especially once the issue of Ephesians 3.9 came up, and I wrote, I think it's 27-page paper, on the issue from their what their perspective is saying about Ephesians 3 9. What did they do? They stopped talking to me. They shut it down. Uh, and so it's it's a completely meaningful question. Why should we be dis having this discussion? Now, from our perspective, from my perspective, the reason we're having this discussion is, is mainly as a warning. It's a warning to my fellow reformed believers that it's possible to be reformed and lose your balance. To abandon a meaningful... Now, the vast majority of Reformed scholars do not buy into this stuff. Now, the vast majority of Reformed scholars have never heard of it, have never encountered it. But this is not what you're going to be taught at RTS, any campus, um, or other places like that. But I, But you go into any... If I post anything almost anywhere on Facebook, the followers of this perspective will land on top of me. I can, I can post something about cycling on Facebook, and someone will comment about the textual issue from this perspective. They're zealous. They're very, very zealous. But the question is a proper question from Dr. Gurry. What do you want to accomplish here? What I found interesting when I first you, you first linked me to this video was that Dr. Riddle is here at all. Because as I recall, Pastor Trulove was fine with the idea of doing the debate. It was Dr. Riddle that vetoed it. Right. So I was surprised that he... Well, this involved. isn't a debate, technically. Well, I'm surprised that he's involved in this at yeah, all. Yeah, I was I really too. Am. I was too. I was too. Just, I get this response that, well, we're confessional and you just don't understand our presuppositions, which to me sounds a lot like just saying, hey, you're never going to understand us until you accept our view. 
At which point then I want to say, well, okay, then fair, fine if that's your view, but then there's no point in us actually talking about it. Does that make sense? Would you disagree with that? Or do I you hear you, but, point? but I mean, don't you want to convince me of your position? I mean, I, no. You don't? I mean, I would like to, but I, I don't have any hopes. And it's, I mean, frankly, I've got a full time job and stuff, so I figured. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, I, I mean like, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't lost, you know, that much sleep <laughs> over, over, you know, your personal convictions about right. this. But I mean, but I mean, I, 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 I do think it is. <laughs> did, did you catch that? Did, did you see that? Let, 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 let me roll that back here, just just for Peter's uh, sake, because um, I'm. I'm a I'm a cat owner myself, so sleep over over you know your personal convictions about right. this, but I mean, and right there we have uh, okay. I'm gonna need to find out from Peter the name of the of the cat that made the um, uh, that made the appearance on in in the film here, but um, that would happen to me, believe you me. Uh, um, the the toughest thing for me to do this from home would be we have a cat named I call him Coper. It's technically Cobra. Does anyone really care? Um, but I call him Coper, and um, when he comes in from outside, he is just a real vocalizer, okay? He wants everybody to know that he's there, and it, it would make, especially something long like this, almost impossible because he's just so loud. I have the cat that wants to lay on the keyboard while you're in the middle oh, of yeah. typing. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, He yeah. wants your fingers, and he will have them. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's. Uh, so we now know that uh, Dr. Gurry is a cat person, uh, and, uh, man, a lot of people hate cat people. I mean, when I say I've got two cats and no dogs, they're like, well, we've had, we've had dogs before. The simple fact of the matter is we can leave our cats at home when we travel and they will be there when we get back. Uh, dog, not so much. Um, remember that time when, when I was, when I debated Staples in Southern California and I had to drive back that night because Lexi had broken through the door. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happens when you have dogs. I mean, I, I, I do think it is. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's an insignificant matter. I mean, this is about the, we're talking about scripture. We're talking about the word of God. And I think it does have huge implications uh, pastorally, experientially. Right. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about, let's, let's go back. Let's go back to the Tyndall House Greek New Testament. Yeah. Is the pericope adulteri part of the word of God or not? No. They have relegated it to the footnotes. I mean, do you think that, do you yeah, think see, woman... That's the assumption. They've relegated it to the footnotes where I could just as well say, but your Bible elevates it to the word of God where it shouldn't be, see? So let me, you, let me you ask you... assume the conclusion. Aside from any theoretical discussions of yeah. that, do you think that the pericope adulteri is scripture? I do not. You do not. So, see, you and I are in the same position, right? You think I'm reading a text that is faulty at that point, and I think you are reading a text that is faulty at that point and several others, right? Okay. So, let me, let so me ask my you question to you is, is there any point in us even discussing it yeah. if the presuppositions are so significant that I can't even seem to understand your position, or at least I can't even, like, do you see what I'm saying? Like, every time I talk to confessional bibliologists, there's, there usually comes a point where they say, it's because I'm confessional, right? And I say, I get that. And I'm trying to say that your confession is wrong at this one point. Now, the only reason I went that far is I just want to say that's not what the confession says. I just, I just want to make sure everyone understands that, that those of us who believe that confessions are vitally important uh, should not be painted into this camp. Uh, the vast majority of people who hold the 1689 Lenin or the Westminster Confession of Faith, do not become this tightly wound in a tight logical circle to where we, we attribute to the framers a perspective that would require them to have information they did not possess. This has been my, my criticism from the start, um, that the framers, whether it's Westminster or the London Baptist Confession, would not have come to the conclusions that these men are coming to had they had the information that we have today. Uh, it's ahistorical. It's a, an abuse and misuse of their, their position. So I want to make sure that everybody gets that. Uh, now, there was an uh, observation that uh, James Snap made, and so let me jump to that one and uh, pick that uh, up. Yeah, and, uh, there, uh, sorry, James. Uh, if, if, if I may. Uh, on the question of what is Scripture, um, 
clearly what is genuinely scripture was scripture before the invention of the printing press. But it seems like if you define things according to the Westminster Confession of Faith, saying that pure means the form, not just the message, but the form, not that, for instance, there, there, are, there are variants where lots of manuscripts will say, he said, but the TR might say, Jesus said. Just like the NIV will sometimes spruce things up and make it more specific. It's a natural tendency. <laughs> um, without the printing press in the equation, okay, we're well, just going to make, make Gutenberg disappear. How do you come up with your position? Because it seems like whenever I look at confession of bibliology, it's completely interchangeable with the TR is always right, and the TR exists because of the printing press. Take the printing press out of the equation, and how do you possibly reach the position that every reading in the TR is always always right? Because when you you, you said, I, I believe, something like uh, when you're reading the copies, you're reading the original. Well, if you read the copies of First John, no CJ, except for the ones that are influenced by, by, by Latin. When you look at Latin, you can see the CJ follows like a puppy dog the transposition that comes along in verse 8. And you can see, and, and for this part, I have to throw you to, to my blog articles, the five, five essays on the coming Johannium, uh, starting with uh, Cyprian and, and the coming Johannium, where, where you can see how it would naturally arise as a gloss, an interpretation of the three, what we know in, with, with, with the CJ as the, the earthly witnesses, throwing an, an, an allegorical interpretation on that, once they're transposed to water, blood, and spirit. After that transposition comes into place, then comes the interpretation, oh, water is the Father, blood, obviously the Son, and spirit, obviously the Spirit. And we see that happening in Old, old Latin. We don't see it happening in Greek. We don't see it happening anywhere where the transposition doesn't happen. So you can pretty easily zoom in on that transposition and see how the CJ emanates from the same transmission line, which isn't in Greek, in other words, isn't in the original text, but is in the Old Latin, a text which is known for glosses. Okay, so I'm going to jump in here real Or Did you have a... You, you had... Okay, so I, I wanted to make sure that uh, those uh, comments uh, got aired, uh, because, again, uh, James Snap is, is not a, a fan of the uh, Nestle Island and, and so on and so forth, but the, the facts are the facts about the Kami Ohanium. And... We are when when I see reformed men running around saying, I, "Oh yeah, I think that I think that that's original." I I just there there is a, there's an inconsistency and an incoherence. And on the one hand, saying we have to believe all the Scripture says about it's teaching about the sovereignty of God, so you've got that sound theology, and then being willing to accept something so far out of any meaningful range of consistency in the handling of historical information uh, to then embrace the concept of, of the Kami Ohanium. It's, um, it's frustrating to a major degree. Okay, what I'm going to do here is, real quickly, um, I thought I already had this up. I didn't. Okay, so that's a mistake on my part, uh, but it is here. I just need to get over to it in um, in Dropbox real quick. There it is. And so here is the they had something happened. I think they lost I think they lost their uh, stream or something, which I can certainly understand. Um, but this is the second part, and it it took off pretty quickly, but now that I'm in a different program, I can speed it up. Just a little bit. So I'm, I'm going to take it up to 1.2. And there's some good stuff here right at the beginning. We'll just go as far as we can go before I see Rich pass out in the other room or something like that. Um, and uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. If I can remember exactly how I... And uh, it's all right. We're going to pick up where we left off and just go straight to a few of the questions that had been coming in. We'll, we'll take about 15 minutes and toss around it, as many questions as we can get through. It'll end up being an hour. Um, <laughs> and then go to closing statements, and that'll be it for this 
episode, and then uh, we'll go from there. But I, I think this has been a really good conversation to have, um, something that has been challenging on both sides for a lot of different reasons. And uh, probably the last 30 minutes, Jeff has been holding his own because I think there's there's been a, there's it been a focus on first John five seven and kind of where the direction goes um, where when there's not a manuscript support for a, a particular variant. And uh, where's God at in that uh, particular, where's God at in the conversation of the whole thing? I think at the end of the day, the question that we're trying to ask, the, the question that we're trying to get an answer to is uh, what is God doing when it comes to the text of the scripture? Um, and why do we have these variants? How do we determine what is the actual scripture? And, and uh, this, to me, has been a really good conversation. I've sat back and just listened to a lot of it. Um, I actually hold the TR position like, like Jeff does, but I'm not a confessional text advocate. Um, so I don't look at it from a confessional perspective. For me, when we're looking at, at passages like 1 John 5-7, I, my own perspective, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll just throw it out there, and I don't think we need to talk about 1 John 5-7 anymore tonight. But um, I, I wonder what, where the, where the, uh, the early um, translations uh, are at in the conversation. I wonder where the, the quotations from the church fathers down through the centuries are in the conversations. Because they, it, it, to me, you can see the evidence of what God has providentially preserved um, and what people actually use, and even if it's not in the Greek manuscript support. so And that may be dangerous to some people to say, well, we're going to go in that direction to decide where the text is going today. Um, but for that particular variant, that's something that I think is something to consider. But anyways, let's go to some of the questions that we've got. Um, I lost all of the questions that came from the 11 different video streaming platforms that were coming in all at once on the last stream. So what I do have is the questions that came in from uh, the Watch Party and the NT Textual Criticism Facebook group. And uh, let's just read a couple of these, and we'll spend about 15 minutes to answer those the best we can, and then we'll go to closing statements. So, all right, so Wayne Story says, I'm enjoying this. Peter, what TR would you recommend? I like the TBS TR by Scrivener, but I realize that some readings... Uh, some readings he footnotes may be better readings. A reading in his text may have only support for Erasmus, while the footnote has a better reading supported by both majority and CR text. This is a question for me? Yes. Yeah, it was. Oh, he directed it yeah, to me. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 this is my copy of Scrivener right above me. That's not, I did not do that just for this show, you know. Uh, <laughs> I use Scrivener all the time. I love it. Um, and, in fact, you know, I just finished writing an article where I defended four TR, uh, sorry, not TR, you can call them TR, although they are in the TR, four Byzantine readings in the Gospel of Matthew where I think the critical texts are wrong. So, um, you know, to James's point, uh, I'm very happy to follow the Byzantine manuscripts, even against the early evidence, when I think the internal evidence is very strongly on their side, and in each of the four cases that I argue. Okay, so I almost can't do 1.2 with Peter because he speaks so quickly, but um, you know what he's saying is uh, now. Now Peter really emphasizes. See, within reasoned eclecticism, you also have different camps. You have those who emphasize, who would lean toward the side of external evidence, and those who would lean toward the side of internal evidence. External evidence is more objective, at least in in the sense that. You're, you're talking manuscripts, um, dates, locations, things like that. Um, the internal can become more uh, subjective in the sense that you, you may be arguing um, author's style, uh, standard uh, uh, scribal error issues, homoi teluton, uh, haplography, whatever. Um, and so it can be, can be taken multiple ways. Um, you know, most people try to find some balance between the two. I, I think what I'm hearing Peter saying is he's more on the internal side by what he just said in taking a Byzantine reading over against much earlier manuscripts. Um, and that, in, in the history of textual criticism over the past 50 years, you've seen, you've sort of seen that balance swing a little bit. Um, depending on who you're reading and, and what's in favor at, at that particular that particular point in time. For my article, uh, that's exactly why I do. Um, so anyways, yeah, but to the question, Scrivener is great. If you find a reading in a footnote that you think is better, good, great. You know, if it is, I mean, keep, keep working on your judgment and your text critical skills. Perfect. Okay, now we've got one more for you, Peter, and, and then I'll see if I can find one for Jeff and James as well. Uh, but this is from Steve Bauer. He asked this question about an hour and a half ago. 
said he was gonna he's he's going to bed and wanted to get the question in anyways hey, and uh, the question if you've gone to bed <laughs> well yeah he said well i'm gonna get my corn and see if i can watch this video uh okay. sometime later but i'm gonna get my question in anyway so anyways uh steve if you get if you get a chance to watch this we did get your question in so all right so peter he says this if as royce has shown I might not be pronouncing that correctly, and somebody still, for whatever reason, anytime somebody um, types a new comment in, it jumps me all the way to the bottom. Okay. He says, if, uh, if as Royce has shown in the early papyri, the tendency was to omit, is there, is there a consensus as to what time frame the tendency to add, through harmonization, for example, begin? Now, that's a good question, and it's a, it's a very technical question. Um, uh, Royce's work on five or six papyri, the, the major early papyri, including P45, which is what I've done most of my interaction with Royce on, uh, but also uh, P75 and P66 and things like that. Um, Royce's focus was upon what's called singular readings, where, for example, P66 would have a reading that, that no other manuscript has. Um, uh, Peter uh, criticized, not criticized, but interacted from an opposite perspective with some of Royce's material in, in his dissertation. Um, uh, it, it, Royce is always something that has to be dealt with, but hasn't like taken the field. I mean, it's a magisterial work. I mean, just the amount of work that went into it is just astonishing, but um, it hasn't taken the field in that most of us would feel that those singular readings are not necessarily the best way of analyzing what any particular uh, scribal, uh, what any particular scribes, tendencies are going to be in the accuracy of the transmission of the, the, the text that they're, that they're copying. So what the person's saying is Royce came to the conclusion that in the papyri, they tended to drop phrases. And so he's asking, given that the later text is longer by a percentage point or two, uh, when did that change from the, early, the period of the early papyri into, say, after a thousand, when you have I, my answer would be, it would seem that once you have monasteries doing copying rather than that very turbulent early period where those, all those manuscripts came from the period of Roman persecution, once you don't have Roman persecution going on, um, then I think you, you didn't have quite the pressure in the, um, in the making of manuscripts. And then you would have more harmonization because it's being done by people who have constant exposure to the scriptures, maybe by having copied multiple copies before and stuff like that. So, yeah. So the ar the argument I just talked about the article is actually on that Oops. point about whether we should prefer the reading or not. And I argue, I don't think we should in principle prefer the shorter reading. I do think it's evident that scribes, uh, do have a tendency to add things to manuscripts, but I don't think it's necessarily stronger than the tendency um, to omit things accidentally, for example. But I do think what you find is over time, scribes are, if they're confronted with two texts and one is shorter and one is longer, I think their tendency very much would have been to preserve a longer reading and, and not yeah. risk. Frankly, it's the same impulse that, that I think Jeff has, and that is it's a, it's a, it's a desire not to lose scripture. There's a, a deep concern about that right. um, on the part of scribes. And so if they have to choose, they'll choose a longer reading if, if they have to make a choice. Um, if we can identify a certain period in which that switches, I'm not sure. In my own research, um, I, I approach with a different method than James Royce did. So really what James Royce found was that the early papyri, the substantial early papyri that he looked at, six of them, show a tendency to omit in what are called singular readings. And singular readings are readings found only in one manuscript. Okay. And part of the big debate about his method is whether singular readings are really indicative of scribal habits as a whole yep. and my co-editor <clears throat> co Elijah Hicks in his dissertation tackles that problem head on he does not think so uh, in my own research I don't think so either so I don't think uh, Royce's method is completely wrong by any means but I also don't think it gives us a complete picture of what scribes did so James you want to comment on that real quick and then so I've got a he, question he for Jeff by, by Alan Parnes and by Hernandez on Revelation and they both point in the same direction Right, but if you look at some others, they don't. See, and that's part of the problem. So, the question is, even if even if all the studies using singular readings pointed in the same direction on this question, we're still only looking at singular readings, and we all know that scribes made more changes than just what's in the singular readings, right? So, that's the question. Okay. All right. Yeah, so, but, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right, that'll wrap oh, that. I was going to say, singular readings was picked because it's easy to tell. Relative, compared, to, compared to other cases, it's not just because it's easy to tell. Actually, uh, I let me. This my as well, so I'm like, it's it's not. Um, given the time, let me, I may skip some stuff I really wanted to deal with, but let's, let's, 
point you were talking about, you know, people, uh, churches that may have held to the so-called shorter ending of Mark, I would say they were wrong. They were in error. Or as I, as I was reading in uh, Eusebius' church history in, in book six and chapter 12 the other day about Serapion of Antioch writing to the, uh, the church at Rosas who had accepted the gospel of Peter and were reading it. And he had to, he had to write to them and say, no, gospel of Peter is docetic and you have to reject that. Right. So, but yes, so that's not there an issue with the woman Yes, there that's were not an issue of the woman con adultery. It's not a question of whether it's heretical or not. On all of our views, the woman con adultery is good theology, is it not? Well, don't you think it's good theology? It's not. Of course, well, you the, think the, it's good the, theology, the, but so the, do the, I. The example, though, applies because it, the, 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 the Serapion of Antioch example, the Gospel of Peter, could be applied to if there was a church that was no, leading I'm not saying, I, no, no, I'm not saying that if a church does something, therefore it's okay. That's not at all what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is when you look at the history of the manuscripts, you realize with something like the Kama Yohannium, most Christians reading 1 John in Greek have not read that text. So even on your view, if you think that the Kama Yohannium is original, should be read by churches, you still have to recognize that there have been lots and lots of people in church history who have not done so. And my question to you is, do you think their faith was fundamentally flawed as a result? And I'm not the saying, I'm, not. First of all, I mean, there were a lot of presuppositions in that. I mean, first of all, you, you presume that because uh, the extant manuscripts don't have it, that that meant that that meant that most Christians did have. I don't know. Well, most, I, I don't, most I don't know Christians what we have evidence for in Greek. That's what I said. But, no, most, and, most Christians and, we have evidence for in Greek did not read the Kama Yohannium. It, well, but it no, doesn't matter if most you, you can't actually or not. you can't actually say that because you only you only have five manuscripts pre seven hundred. Now, now here is being said here. So he has no evidence, none of the presence of that text in sermons, in uh, this is exactly what happened with Ephesians 3.9. So, once you start with this, then history becomes twisted. What, what Peter's saying is that we, we have no evidence that anyone were, was reading these words. Did, does that mean that they had a defective faith? And he's like, well, we don't know they weren't reading these words even though I can't give you a shred of evidence that they were, you can't disprove it. Well, that's, again, this is the luxury of not actually having a textual critical position that you're actually defending. You're defending a conclusion. You're defending a text. You're not defending a textual critical methodology because you could never derive a text using this type of reasoning. This is what we... tr onlyism cannot produce a text. It can only promote a text. Uh, and and here it is being, and you can see the look on James Snap face. He's going, what 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 are you doing? Um, you know, and it's the same frustration we all have. You you say that the people who, you can say the people who had the extant well, manuscripts did not have it within theirs. But I'm even on, that that doesn't mean that their faith that doesn't mean that their faith in and of itself was flawed or that they weren't saved or converted. But it does mean it does mean that they were they suffered a deficiency that they sure. missed out on a benefit that they might have <laughs> received. They didn't, how big was it? How big was the benefit? They had the Trinity uh, without that. Medieval first. manuscripts didn't spring out of the ground from dragon's teeth. They're echoing earlier copies, so you can make the extrapolation. There's no reason to think the earlier copies of those echoes. Well, we've already established added. that, but yeah, I don't think Jeff accepts I mean, good on that. The same point. way when, when, a, when a voice goes <laughs> forth and the echo. Doesn't have the words. You, but it is. You just, the voice didn't have the words. But it is a problem. We, we, we hear the voice from, from the old gonna, I don't think you're going to convince Jeff of that. It is a problem. <laughs> it is a problem. I mean, go back to the, 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 the ending of the book of Revelation. You know, we're not supposed to. We're not supposed to add. We're not supposed to take away. And so there is. Which has nothing to do with this at all. I. When I start hearing people grabbing for texts like that as if that is a textual critical statement in defense of a text that does not appear in Greek manuscripts until well after 1000 AD and it's really more like 1300 AD I'm concerned because I've seen that from King James Onlyus for a long long time but this man is a fellow Reformed Baptist pastor. Should know better. Should know better. But is promoting something otherwise. Uh, there is an issue of the preservation of the Word of God. Um, and, 
And, and so, yes, there is a problem if there's a part of the word of God that's an inspired word of God that is being omitted. Sure, but let's put that in context. The word of How big of a problem is it? If somebody's just throwing something into the Lord of God from the old Latin that was made up by an interpreter, there's something. There's a problem there, right. too. And that's, yeah, that's there, part there of what i There would be a problem with addition as well. Right. And, there, and, there's, problem, and there's a problem with addition of companion. Yeah. So this is what I'm trying to say. You can see the companion originate in Latin. And you can see how it's drifted into the Greek from the Latin. You can see the mechanism that caused it to be created in Latin. And you can see that it's nowhere except in Latin. And yet suddenly we're supposed to think, well, we're getting a little into that specific where I think you wanted to uh, to, 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 to start wrapping up. But, but you can see where, where the general picture is. I think the problem, the real problem is that confessional ecclesiology, e even though it's often claimed we don't reconstruct the text, that's because you just pick your favorite reconstruction that was made in the 1500s yep. and lock it in and yep. say that's the text. Ding, 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 ding. Before the training for us, you couldn't do that. Yep. You wouldn't do that. You would look at the manuscripts and do textual criticism. Ecclesiastical bibliology is basically an excuse to not do the work. <laughs> saying, pretending that it's already been so done. So it's just, it's just laziness. Know, we all know that it hasn't been done. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't call it laziness. I, 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 I don't think it's a, a, a matter of laziness. It's a matter of confessional conviction. Well, can I, can I jump in? I don't think it's... The statement is wrong, because the text was purely not kept that way in that sense. It's not pure in, in its exact form, the way that you're defining that as. It's simply Jeff, not would a you, statement. Would you say... Jeff, see, I really hate to see my confession being dragged around like this. And, and one of the reasons I'm doing this, I'm hoping people understand, this is not confessionalism. This is a one-off, strange misinterpretation, misapplication. It's ahistorical. Um, the, 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 the framers did not have the information we have today. And so I just, but again, Snap's exactly right. Um, it, it's, it just refuses to do the work. But that's because it can't do the work. It has no foundation upon which to do the work. That's that's the issue. That's the issue. Would you say that your confessional position is partly driven by a fear of the alternative position, namely mine? That is a fear of where it leads. I don't think so. I mean, I don't you think, don't, it's, I don't you don't think, think there's something to be afraid of, in my view. I, I think that there's nothing wrong with 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 seeing dangers. And it's it's right, right to be it's right yeah. to be fearful of something that's dangerous. Right. So you're and afraid think, of the dangers you see in my view. Well, I, yeah. I yes, and, yeah. but I, I also have a love for what I think is right and true, and sure. a zeal for what is right and uh, what is right and true. So right. just as just as I think, I mean, if I were to turn that around, I mean, and to say so so far, what I've heard is, confessional text advocates are lazy and fearful. What he actually said was they're not willing to do the work, and the person who said lazy was Jeff Riddle. That wasn't that was neither Peter nor James. It was it was it was Jeff Riddle who said you're saying we're lazy, <clears throat> and now he's repeating that as if that was actually what they were what they were saying. But it is true, they are not doing the work. They are they're they're allowing Erasmus and Stephanus and Beza to do the work. And then forgetting that they did the work and not being willing to examine what work they did. That's true. I mean, it's, isn't this self-evident? I don't know how you guys can get around this. That's why I said when last year when I started reading sections out of uh, the, the book on, on uh, Erasmus and Beza as conjectural uh, critics, and I started reading what they actually said themselves about these texts. I said, this is the end of TR onlyism in any in, in a confessional sense, because it exposes where the text actually came from and the methodology that by which it came. That's why I said it. You're and, still with and, me, huh? And to speak to the uh, the question of saying they're lazy, there's a big difference between laziness and avoiding the work because you don't you know where it leads and you don't want to do it because you don't like the conclusion and the path that it's going to take you down. Yeah. And that's, that's not laziness. No, no. That's, that was that was unfair. Uh, actually, maybe a little harder work than it would have otherwise be. <laughs> Stay lazy. So, well, he, uh, that's what Jay said, and I'm, yeah. you know, uh, I, I'm being a little, little retarded. The method is lazy. But anyways, I don't know. I, I, I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I, that would be like me saying to you, "Well, 
James, you're just you're just lazy because you haven't read Garnet Howard Milne's discussion of kept pure in all ages. And you keep hey, using, you keep using an anachronistic term to describe it. And I could say, Peter, you're just fearful. You're fearful of the fact that uh, confessional the confessional text position is right. And if it's right, then, you know, you don't have a job sifting through manuscripts or whatever. Now, now, now catch that. He would be exactly right. Because, again, he's going to say no later on, because Peter's going to challenge him on this. Or maybe he already did, and we skipped it. I don't know. But there is no reason to teach New Testament textual criticism if tr onlyism is right. If, if you're reading the autograph with this, we don't need those manuscripts. Shut down CSNTM. Uh, turn off all the modules in accordance. We've got, here's the autograph, right there. There's the autograph. Thankfully, not all of the ecclesiastical text guys that way. And Doug Wilson and I are going to be addressing that yet again next month in Moscow, Idaho, by the way. And I'm going to take my 1550 with me. Um, I, I'm, I'm really hopeful that Doug doesn't go there. Uh, really, really hopeful that Doug doesn't go there. Because that, that, no, no, that would be bad. That, so but see, the difference... I'm is, not as I, what I'm saying is it's wrong for you. Yeah. It's wrong and it's unfair for you to say that because you don't agree with my position that it's you're you're ascribing malice to me. No, no. I'm just lazy and fearful. Can I go back to this? No, this? Because I think you're, mis, you're misrepresenting. And I, it's my fault, actually, because I didn't make the point clear enough. It, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. The theological danger of my view from your position is bigger than the theological danger of your position from mine. And therefore, you have more to be afraid of theologically, okay, and rightly so if your position is right. You have more to be afraid of. Sorry, let me put it a different way. The dangers of my view from your perspective are more significant than the dangers that I see in your perspective, in your view from let me, mine. Let me ask you this. Do you, do you think that, do you right. think that the, the rise of modern historical text criticism and the fact that uh, many Protestants and now evangelicals are embracing it. Do you think this has led to um, th th this has this led to greater health and strength within Protestant and evangelical churches? Now, now the only th way I can understand this is that he's thinking primarily of Westcott and Hort there, and ignoring the fact that we demonstrated and many other people have demonstrated that Erasmus and Beza, but especially Erasmus, basically used the same methodology, just with, without as much consistency and nearly as much information. But he used many of the exact same concepts that we use in quote-unquote modern textual critical setting. No, well, no, because I don't think it's really that powerful of a thing. I guess that's part of the, the difference between you and I. I. I think in your view, text criticism is kind of the root that's the problem of a bad tree. And, and I kind of feel like <laughs> like my discipline isn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't have near that kind of power over people. I mean, frankly, most people have no idea about text criticism, and it doesn't yep, affect yep, their life. Peter, you're training, you're, you're, training, <laughs> you're training pastors. Yeah, and this is what I'm trying to gonna, explain. Who are going to go out and preach Sunday by Sunday, and, are, and they, when they preach an expositional series through the Gospel of Mark, or and it, actually, oddly enough, you, we, we have some agreement on Mark, because I know you don't believe it, you don't believe it's original to Mark, but you, right. you think it's inspired, right? You sort of like Metzger. Uh, sort of like Tregellis, actually. Yeah. Okay. And like but anyways. Warfield. On that, but yeah, maybe it, maybe it would be John. So you're you are very influential. You are you, your views you on this me. are influential, and it and it does have a generational legacy. Yeah, it has impact on people. And, and if I'm right, I, that's a good and, thing, right? And and we're if seeing my position is right. That's a good thing. Well, what I'm saying is what you're saying is the fruit. Is what bad. I'm saying is that if we observe, and again, I'm not I'm not about this just pragmatically. I'm I'm have a, a conviction about it. Right. Out of uh, you know principle, right. but I'm saying that pragmatically, the result of the introduction of the modern historical critical method, in this case, its application to text criticism, has not been salubrious for Orthodox Christianity. I'm or Orthodox with a small O. Well, I, I wouldn't agree with the, um, the premise of your argument. I, I don't think text criticism, even if it's in its modern form, 
is is a necessary part of the historical critical method. Um, certainly, the methods were refined during that period, but I don't see anything fundamentally different between what I do and what Origen or Jerome did. So it can't be. It can't be. I know it's. I know it's very popular oh. to do and very tempting to pin it all on the Enlightenment, but I. I wish it were that simple, and it's just not that simple historically. So James, let's get you... Your question. Let's get your question. I don't think it's harmful. No, I think it's helpful to people to actually explain to them the evidence that we do have and not try to say, you know, ignore the evidence in no, a case I'm not like saying 1 John 5, 7. No, but in 1 good, John 5, 7, from I'm my view, you are ignoring ignore, the evidence. I'm not saying ignore it. You, you are. It. It. Of course it. you are. I mean, how, of course he is. Of course he's saying ignore the evidence. If, if this is it, then there is no evidence... To look at beyond this, oh, or the only evidence to look at is that which substantiates this. So, but of course he's saying, let's not worry about the. Evidence. He's not starting with evidence, and he admits that in other in other places. So, look, we've gone a long, 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 long time, uh, and and I apologize for that. But I, the, uh, you can look it up. I'll I'll link to it. Uh, I write the blog entry, so I will link to it. So because it's two parts, uh, I'll link to both parts. So you can listen to the whole thing yourself. Nothing else that, that we didn't play is going to change anything of the fact that you had two textual critical scholars who were consistent in their own perspectives and as a result had to say that the third perspective, which is not a textual critical methodology, um, is incoherent. It's just incoherent. Because it it says the TR is it, therefore the TR is it. And that really, when you boil it all down, is exactly what TR onlyism is. You can complicate that, you can try to uh, but but you're, you're, that's it's your starting place. And well, you have to have that and that's when they try to tie it into some type of transcendental argument. And I'm sorry, the the work of Erasmus, a Roman Catholic priest, uh, with Stephanus doing a little bit of stuff, uh, and then Beza, um, to try to turn that into, well, basically what the King James only is say took place between 1604 and 1611, a providential establishment of the autographs. Because that's what King James onlyism is. King James onlyism is, in English, this is it. This cannot be improved. That's what we're hearing from Jeff Riddle in Greek. This is it. Cannot be improved. Let's not worry about papyri, the new unseal that's discovered in the library someplace that's never, never had access to. Doesn't matter. If you're reading the TR, you're reading the autographs by definition. And so, yeah, there's no reason to have all those people doing textual critical studies. It's all a waste of time. And we didn't get to the part where he was talking about, and because there's been people who have gone off into Eastern Orthodoxy, gone off into Roman Catholicism, all because of an uncertainty about the text. And that's not why I think people end up going into those things. It's not about uncertainties about the text. And the funny thing is, they're not going to get any more certainty over there. I mean, Rome as a whole has a significantly less conservative perspective the, the Roman magisterium and Roman scholarship has a significantly less conservative perspective on textual critical issues than someone like Peter Gurry or the people at Tyndale House by a long shot. And Eastern Orthodoxy just simply, I'm sorry, uh, given, well, that, that's, that's a whole nother issue. Uh, that, that's, uh, the, but it doesn't have anything to do with textual critical issues. So, wow, we've gone for two hours and 40 minutes. Um, that's beyond mega. I don't even know what that adds up to. Um, um, but uh, a jumbo mega or whatever it is. Uh, but lots of stuff has happened even while we've been discussing all this stuff. Most of you have gone to sleep. I realize that. But for those of you who stuck with us all this time, you're doing this because you've seen this tearing of our churches. You've seen it causing division. Uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that anywhere I go on Facebook, I can comment on a cat video, and TR only guys will jump me on a cat video. It has happened. Let alone any discussion. There was a in a presupposition uh, yesterday, yesterday, the day before yesterday, in a presuppositional group on Facebook, uh, someone f posted a King James only meme, and boom, there they came, just that fast. As soon as I, you know, someone said, "How do I respond to this?" and I gave a link to my book. 
It's almost like they have a search thing set up. Uh, look, James White's out in the open. Get him, you know, type thing. Uh, that's seriously. That's 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 what they're that's what they're about. Um, and so they are very zealously promoting this. Um, but the only way to promote it is to promote to people who do not understand how we got the Bible in the first place. If you have any idea about the history of the manuscripts of the Bible before 1500, you are not going to be buying this. You're not going to be buying it. And I think that was shown very, very clearly. I'm very thankful to both Peter Gurry and to James Snap. And I want to find a time to have dinner with James Snap. And James, here, let me throw this out just because someone's probably already told you that you, you need to log on because James White has said a dozen nice things about James Snap today. Um, I don't think it would be wise for you and I to do something like this because we are set in our ways, but the thought crossed my mind after I watched this the first time, given your position in a Campbellite type tradition, I wonder if we could do a debate on something like John six, not on the text issues. Cause there's really isn't, I'm unaware of any particularly meaningful textual issue in John chapter six, but we could discuss soteriology, maybe something outside of where the battle is always going, but we both have very strong feelings in that area. Maybe that'd be something that we could do uh, in the future. I, I just, all I know is um, I very, very, very much appreciated um, the information at the same time. Anyone who's watched this program is sitting there going, Yep, heard that before, but this was just another way of shining some light on it. And for all of those, for all of you who have decided this is how to save the day or, or make yourself different, if the TR only position fares that badly in the face of extremely conservative, believing Christian criticism, just think how badly it will do out in the real world of apologetics. Keep it in mind. Keep it in mind. Well, my voice is about to go. So uh, it's been it's been a long one. So <laughs> appreciate your uh, sticking with us for all this time. Um, my I think my goal for tomorrow is Radio Free Geneva. So we will see. We will see. We'll see you then. God bless.